Morning, everybody. Can please take your oh, that's very, very nice. People are very personable. Under the lights, I can't really see you. Um, okay. Hi, good morning. My name is Adam Huddleston. I'm a senior program analyst here at the Information Security Oversight Office, or ISOO. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you to the 2017 ISOO Open House. First, a quick public service announcement. Uh, please turn off your cell phones or put them to vibrate so you don't disturb our speakers, each other, or me, most importantly. Just kidding. Uh, today's event will provide an introduction to the many functions and responsibilities of ISU and provide opportunities for conversations between and among attendees and presenters. The order of events is as follows. After introductory remarks by David Ferriero, the Archivist of the United States, our ISU Director Mark Bradley will provide an overview on current and future ISU efforts. After a networking break, a panel of agency representatives will discuss how their agencies implement their CNSI self-inspection programs. Following that, we'll have an update on developments in the CUI <clears throat> CUI program. Uh, the presentation materials used today will be made available after the event at online at archives.gov slash ISU. Now I have the honor of introducing David S. Ferriero, the 10th Archivist of the United States. Mr. Ferriero was confirmed as the Archivist on November 6, 2009, and since then has led the Archives through a structural transformation designed to better position our agency to meet its obligations as the nation's record keeper and information manager. Mr. Ferriero earned bachelor's and master's degrees in English literature from Northeastern University in Boston and a master's degree from the Simmons College of Library and Information Science. He also served as a Navy hospital corpsman during the Vietnam War. Mr. Ferriero came to the archives after leading the New York Public Libraries as the Andrew W. Mellon Director and leading the libraries of the Univer of Massachusetts, Institution Massachusetts Institute of Technology and Duke University. Please join me in welcoming David Ferriero. Good morning, and welcome to my house. It's nice to have you here on this historic day for the National Archives, and I wish I could tell you something. <laughs> As do those folks camped out across the street. Thank you for being here for our third annual Information Security Oversight Office Open House, and for all that you do every day to ensure the proper management of national security classified information and controlled unclassified information throughout the federal government. The work you do is important to the healthy functioning of our government and to our democracy. We at the National Archives strive to fulfill our mission and our open government commitment to make access happen. Vital to our success is the continued conversation we have with our internal and external stakeholders. This engagement is essential to help us improve our services and help us serve our democracy by providing access to high-value government records. In a free society, citizens must have meaningful access to information regarding the actions government takes on their behalf. This access is only possible with openness, transparency, and accountability. In today's digital environment, information protection and sharing is more complex and challenging than ever, and it is increasingly critical that information, when it must be withheld from the public, be protected in an appropriate, consistent, cost-effective, and transparent manner. On December 1st, 1978, Pre President Jimmy Carter established the Information Security Oversight Office with the signing of Executive Order 12065, which means that next year, ISU will be celebrating its 40th year overseeing the systems that protect national security information. As ISU enters its fifth decade, it will strive, as it always has, to ensure the minimum information necessary is protected and that information is declassified as soon as it is no longer as soon as it no longer requires protection. Last year, ISU reported to the president that the total cost of security classification government wide has nearly doubled in the last decade and now approaches seventeen billion dollars a year, which is several billion dollars more than the annual budget of the Department of Interior. Costs have doubled even while the rate at which original classification decisions are being, are being made has fallen by over 80% from nearly 233,000 original decisions in 2007 to just over 39,000 in 2016. ISU also reports that while declassification has been trending upwards since 2012, the number of pages declassified in 2016, nearly 54 million, is only 18 percent above 2007 levels a year when the government was spending half as much on security classification programs. 
ISO will continue to collect and analyze statistics government-wide, security classification costs and activities to report them to the President. Concerns with how another kind of control information was being handled across the federal government led ISU to greatly expanding its mission in 2010, assuming the leadership of the new controlled unclassified information program created by Executive Order um, 13556. The COI program was established to reform the inconsistent and sometimes conflicting patchwork of agency-specific policies, procedures, safeguarding measures and labels used to handle sensitive unclassified information throughout the executive branch. I'm pleased to say that after many years of work and following a rigorous and deliberate stakeholder evaluation, controlled unclassified information, 32 CFR part 2002, was established in the Federal Register last year. And in support of the publication of the regulation, ISU as executive agent of the program has been assisting agencies in preparing for implementation by conducting formal appraisals of existing agency practices and raising awareness through briefings, training sessions, and panel discussions. I'm also pleased to note that late last year, as many of you no doubt are already aware, President Obama approved the appointment of Mark Bradley as director of ISU. Mark previously served as the director of FOIA declassification and pre-publication review at the Department of Justice. Prior to joining DOJ, he served as a CIA intelligence officer and legislative director for Senator pa Daniel Patrick Moynihan, where he co-drafted the legislation that established the Public Information Declassification Board. Mark is a graduate of Washington and Lee University and holds an MA in Modern History from Oxford and a JD from the University of Virginia. His book, A Very Principled Boy, The Life of Duncan Reed, Red Spy and Cold War, Cold Warrior won the George Pendleton Prize in 2015 from the Society for History in the Gov Federal Government. I'm happy to have Mark serving as the seventh director of ISU and hope that he will have your support and cooperation as he steers the organization to best meet its important and expanding mission. Today's meeting is an opportunity for you as information security professionals to learn what ISU is doing to better assist you in fulfilling our shared mission of protecting and providing proper access to government information. It's also an, an important opportunity to interact with ISU leadership and staff and with each other as we prepare to meet the challenges ahead. Again, thank you for participating in today's program and for your continued support of ISU and the National Archives. Morning, everyone. Thanks for, uh, for coming. As David said, this could be a very historic day here at the National Archives, so we shall, uh, we shall see. I wanted to speak about uh, four things today. I wanted to give you just a brief overview of how we even came into existence, uh, explain to you a bit about our broad mandate, explain to you why I think we're at a crossroads, and then explain to you where I think uh, we're going to go in the coming year. Believe it or not, ISU was created at a time when the American people distrusted our government even more than they do now. It uh, came out of a time uh, the agony of the Vietnam War and also the shocking revelations of uh, a Watergate. In fact, although we're not directly a child of the church and pike committees, we are very close. The idea was is that we're a democracy, yet we also face some very serious threats. And so what was needed in the game of classification, declassification in particular, was an umpire. A balls and strikes umpire who could call them as he or she saw it. Not influenced by agency cultures, agency histories, agency opinions, but to sit there as an umpire and see the ball come across the plate one way or the other and call it that way. That's been our reputation and that's the reputation I intend to, uh, to maintain. It's critical, again, you have somebody behind the plate who can call the balls as he or she sees them. The history of ISU, as David said, now approaches its 40th anniversary. And it's interesting. My guess is, although I'm not sure, that the first director of ISU would see things that the seventh director of ISU still sees. I still believe we classify too much and don't declassify enough. 
And again, if you think about it, uh, again, you know, as I said, this could be an historic day for us. I mean, as David said, we'll find out ourselves here uh, probably this afternoon. But it, it's a tremendous thing to have or, or, or a tremendous worry to have that if the American people don't trust their own government, uh, it un kind of undermines the entire system. And what Thomas Jefferson, as I'll quote, as a University of Virginia graduate, uh, you know, believed very much that the best way to preserve a democracy was to have a educated citizenry. People who were educated enough about what their government did to actually begin to believe in their government because the government was telling them the truth. So that's kind of the, the touchstone. Yet on the other side of the coin, as I said earlier, I mean, we face probably greater national security threats in our history. Uh, I don't know, not probably arguably in our history, but certainly you know, the grave threats that we face haven't gone away. I mean, we've, we've got a, a very uh, you know, rambunctious Soviet, uh, so I'm dating myself now, Soviet Union, Russia. We, we have North Korea. I mean, now we're, ISIS is spreading out of the Middle East into Africa. It remains a very dangerous place, as Daniel Patrick Moynihan would say. Yet we're a democracy, and we have to behave like a democracy. So somewhere in between, we have to cut, cut it right. Declassify enough to preserve trust. Classify enough to protect our national security. It's a tremendous responsibility that we and ISU have. And I, I'm proud to say that I've got a very good staff who believes exactly in those concepts. So we're, no, we're blessed with, uh, with that. They're some of the finest civil servants I've ever worked with. And I have to say again, you know, I, I think uh, David Ferriero is, is a hero of mine. I mean, he's not only the best red guy I've ever met, but again, he, he served in Vietnam as a, as a corpsman. I, I can't, I mean, unimaginable really. All right, what does ISU do? It's got uh, tremendous uh, broad mandate. I, I call us a, a boxer who boxes much above his weight. I mean, we're, we're, we're small, but we're feisty and we're fast, and we can hit hard, but you know, we're small, <laughs> and we can get pinned in, into the ropes from time to time and have to bob and weave a bit. As David said, you know, we oversee five executive orders, uh, and these things range from how the government, federal government declassifies and classifies information to our new uh, uh, controlled unclassified information program, to the National Industrial Security Program, to state, tribal, local program, to critical infrastructure program. So it's an extraordinarily broad mandate. We also manage something called the Interagency uh, Security Classification Appeals Panel, which I think is the crown jewel of the government's declassification effort. Uh, that board which is made up of, of different agencies, uh, state, uh, ODNI, Justice, uh, National Archive, National Security Council, DOD. Here's the most sensitive uh, declassification appeals in the federal government. And I'm proud to say that its record is really astonishing. It's gotten some extraordinarily important things out to the American public in a very collegial and collaborative setting. Uh, it, it, it's, it's a remarkable body. And I think, it, again, I, I can't say enough about the good work it does. We also staff something called the Public Interest Declassification Board, which I actually co-wrote the legislation when I worked for, uh, for Pat Moynihan. It's a presidential advisory board that counsels the president on what should be declassified in our massive archives, not just the national archives, but in, in agencies too. It's astonishing uh, when you think about, you know, uh, the, the intelligence agencies well, we didn't really have an intelligence service in World War II. We had something called the OSS, had about 13,000 people. Nothing that happened in World War II would really be recognizable now. We have a massive uh, intelligence service. Was it 17, 16, I guess a sweet 16 with, with another one hoping to join. Uh, and so you can imagine all the documents and all the history that's secreted away in some of these agencies' archives. And the PIDB is looking at this to try to prioritize uh, which should be uh, got out to the American people. And so it's a, it's a uh, bipartisan board that takes its mission very seriously. Again, to look at our history and figure out what exactly is it, what are the gaps? What don't the American people know that they should know? And then they uh, you know, advise the president on, on their decisions. I, too, as, as director of ISU, sit on a host of committees uh, and boards, as you can imagine, councils. Uh, one of the biggest problems we've got now is a massive security clearance backlog. 
it's critical that we have people cleared to work in these areas, yet we have a massive backlog. Why is that? Well, it's called 9-11, really. Uh, you know, since that time, uh, this community has exploded in, in terms of uh, numbers of employees. It, it's, uh, when I started the DOJ, I worked in an arcane office that did the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. Uh, and um, I think I was the 12th attorney uh, hired by that office. Now it's got over 300. And you can just see the plethora of, 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 of explosion, really, of, of, of staff that's come into this type of national security work. But everybody who comes into this work has to be cleared, right? And that takes a lot of effort to do it. So we're constantly trying to figure out how to streamline that, how to make it faster, how to make it uh, more reliable. But uh, again, you know, working at, at, at with the, the concept that we're we're a democracy, yet we've got to be very careful with some of the stuff that we that we hold. We can't afford to have people come into the government insider threats to steal our uh, our stuff. So it takes a lot of screening, a lot of vetting to make sure we get the right people in here. That's what we do in a very broad brush, and you'll, you'll hear more about our self-inspection program, you'll hear more about our controlled unclassified information program, which we are in the implementation stage of a little later on. That said, I, I really believe we're at a crossroads uh, in this country and also in this office. What we're seeing is uh, our declining resources, yet an explosion of information, especially classified information. I can see whether I can misquote this figure. I think the Reagan White House generated something like 75,000 classified emails. The Obama was up in the billions. So you can see the problem. I mean, it's just a tsunami wave of information. So the question is, how do we do effective oversight over this? How do we make sure that what's being classified is being done properly? Being done properly, and then how do we <laughs> ensure that uh, the information that needs to be declassified is, right? It's an extraordinary uh, uh, problem to, to be confronted with. I think that the answer to that probably lies in this room, and it, especially with some of our, uh, our partner agencies. What we're trying to do uh, now in, in ISU is to leverage every bit of technology uh, we have. It's now 20... 17, soon to be 2018. You know, the government, in my view, is woefully behind technologically in being able to, to handle these, this massive data that's coming our way. And so we have to be much, uh, much smarter about this because we can't do it anymore the way that we've been doing it. It's just not going to work. And what I worry about, I don't call myself an historian. I, I call myself a civil servant who writes at night and on weekends. Um, I worry about this because I think there may come a time when we may know more about ancient Rome than we know about our own time if we don't get this stuff out and if we don't find a way to get our arms around it. One way to do this is what the PIDB is doing, which is to actually prioritize what we have. How do we do that? Well, I think it's going to take collaboration between the government, especially our historians and people who know these records, and also public interest groups, the American Historical Association, American Political Science Association, experts in the field, to be able to direct us in what they think we should declassify. Right now, the, the process, as you know, relies too much on an ad hoc system. It's, it's FOIA. And, you know, unfortunately, uh, particularly after the Edward Snowden revelations, a lot of the FOIA shops have become litigation shops. They're defending themselves in court. I think State Department, I don't want to misquote Steve, I think has 120 lawsuits now. Yeah. 109. Yeah. 109 lawsuits. Again, the, 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 the time that it takes to defend a lawsuit, especially when you're under a court order, uh, I don't have to tell you which goes to the top of the pile. It's the one the federal judge is screaming about. So the reg routine FOIAs get what? They don't get done, or they get pushed back in the queue. MDRs, that. Uh, come to the ice cap. Again, a wonderful system, but uh, not exactly a uh, racehorse system. It's very deliberative. It takes, it takes time, especially when you're working around the table with different agencies because each agency has what? It has equities in its own documents. And to be fair, you, know, you have to show them their equities. You can't, you, you can't ignore that. But if we prioritize, you know, if we have more agreement among 
uh, the different agencies and among the public, then we might be able to get somewhere with, with this. Again, the, you know, it would be interesting to see how the, how the JFK Act finally winds up. I mean, that could be a uh, kind of a, I don't want to say a template, but it, it could be a kind of an example of, of can the government really get out a targeted collection of, of records that is of the highest public interest that will satisfy the public, not just get out stuff, but actually satisfy the public. Huge hurdle to, to overcome. But I don't think we can go on again as we are. As you know, we have Executive Order 13526, and in there you have something called automatic declassification, which means a document, once it reaches 25 years, should be automatically de be declassified unless it meets these exemptions. Well, the numbers aren't, aren't particularly good. I mean, they got, we review a lot of pages, I think uh, 96 million, and we got, probably got 39 million of them out. The problem with that system, though, is a lot of them aren't very historically valuable. They don't mean a lot. How can we improve that system? It's no point in spending money on things that aren't of value, it seems to me, especially in this day and age, because I can tell you standing right up here, classification, declassification, especially the declassification side, has never been a particularly high priority. <laughs> For government funding, right? That's again a, a pity because, as as somebody who believes very much in our democracy, uh, again I think it's incumbent upon us to get these documents out. And you know, I, I, it's also interesting to me too. The, these agencies have a lot of very good stories to tell. There are a lot of heroic actions in these documents. There are a lot of great things that these these agencies have done. It's, it's not all been <coughs> black bag stuff in the middle of the night and, and violating civil rights and all the rest. So it's interesting, you know, I, I'll give a plug for my wife's book as long as I'm up here. She just wrote a book uh, called Code Girls, the, the hidden story of the American women code breakers in World War II. But you would think in 2017 that that would be a common story, right? I mean, this takes place during World War II, right? The United States enters December 7th, 1941. War goes until August of 45, right, when we finally defeat Japan. This is a brand new story for many American people. Why was that story withheld for so long? Why didn't we know about the tremendous effort of these women? There were 10,000 of them who stepped forward in a time of need to save their country. Why are we just hearing about this now? It's a good story for the NSA. It's a wonderful story for code breaking. You know, we were able to defeat the Japanese and the Germans. We were able to preserve democracy. Yet we're still we're just learning about this now. So this is not a good way to, to do things. We need to get this stuff out. Okay? Now, how can we do that? One of the things that we are, are trying to do as we go forward is to uh, either rewrite or, how can I put this? I don't want to say repair, but, but do some maintenance on 13526, kind of the, the, the key document in how we classify and declassify. Starting uh, next week, we will begin to have meetings at the National Security Council on doing exactly that. Now, what will come of it, I don't know. I can't make any promises. We have uh, enlisted our public interest friends. Steve Aftergood over here and others have very kindly given us some reforms they'd like to see. We uh, will soon be reaching out to agencies to figure out what they'd like to see. Again, trying to have a collaborative effort that will, will work for us all. Now, who holds the keys to all this stuff? Well, it's whoever's got the key to the bank vault, right? That's Congress. It's been 20 years since the Moynihan Commission. Pat Moynihan, uh, visionary really, and, and God knows there's nobody like him now. The old joke was, you know, Moynihan had uh, written more books than most of his colleagues had read, and that unfortunately is true. Um, was one of the very few people who grasped this, this problem again, this idea of democracy and security and, and regulation and deregulation. I don't think uh, Pat would recognize the current system just in terms of his volume. I think he would be staggered by how much classified information we're producing now. Yet he would understand a lot of the same problems. I mean, we have cultural resistance. We have uh, uh, constant worry about giving our, our adversaries a leg up. But he, one thing he would certainly recognize would be the lack of money <laughs> for this effort. So one of the things we're doing, again, through the PIDB and others, is to reach out to Congress to try to enlist their aid in getting them to pay attention to this. Again, it seems to me a bipartisan issue, right? But also to begin to put money into this, to repair or to replace our aging infrastructure, 
I mean, you know, you talk about roads and bridges and all that, yes. But the government's classification, declassification system also needs an overhaul. Well, Congress is the only ones with the money. So we've got to take a chance and go up and reach out and engage in a dialogue, and that's already begun. So stay tuned for, for that. If we can have another Moynihan Commission, or if we can have somebody who's actually a visionary again to look at this, I think they'll see the problem. As the archivist said, I mean, we're spending $17 billion a year now on that, and I'm not quite sure what we're getting for it. I think we need to get more. I think we need to, to press for more. Another thing that, that we want to do, is, at least internally, is I'd like to make ISU more useful to our uh, partners in the federal government and also to those on the outside. By that, I, I mean I'd like to make our annual report to the president more analytical and more uh, kind of far-reaching in a way to actually begin to raise some, some questions for people to, uh, to think about. It's, don't get me wrong, I'm not criticizing the way that we've done it. I think it's, it's been brilliant in, in a lot of ways. But we're moving into an area now where I think it's incumbent upon ISU to begin to take more of the lead in some of these areas and begin to beat the drums and ring the alarm bells a bit that this is a very serious uh, problem. I mean, Pat Moynihan always said, you know, what's a, you know, it's only by working in government do you understand the limitations of government. That's probably right. And, you know, I'm beginning to see the limitations of our current system. And, you know, it, it is, uh, it's worrisome. You know, I, I wouldn't go terrifying, but it, it's, it's, it's very worrisome. And so we need to begin to really focus on this issue. Lastly, one of the things that I'd like to do uh, this uh, coming year is, is to begin to, to uh, fully implement or at least you know, begin to give our CUI program uh, its full legs. As you know, it's uh, based on an executive order, it's based on a federal rule, and it's based on uh, the backing of the White House. So it's time that federal agencies will begin to take this seriously. It's not going to go away. It's not going to be reversed. It's not going to be um, changed. What we will do, though, as we imp implement it, is to watch very carefully how that's being done. And if there are improvements that need to be made or tweaks that need to be made or adjustments, we will certainly uh, do those. One of the uh, things I want to do as I, as I close is to make a, a plea. And that plea is from, from us to you, that uh, if you're having trouble in any of the executive orders that we oversee, please, please let us know. We can come to where you are. We can sit down with you. We can help you work through problems. You know, the worst problems are those that are neglected, that become much bigger problems. So again, as, as you begin to implement CUI or, or you're having trouble with, with uh, you know, your data for the annual report that you're giving us or you don't understand something that we're asking for, phone call away. Yeah, very, very easy to find. In fact, you know, I'm shocked how easy uh, I am to find. I come from a a darker world, <laughs> and I, for the first time in my career, I've got windows, you know? and, and for the first time in my career, I'm publicly listed now. So I get emails all the time, and it's like, I got one from Time Magazine yesterday, and I'm sitting there thinking to myself, oh, Christ. Then I realized, wait a minute, I'm the director of ISU. I should be getting emails from Time Magazine. <laughs> in my prior life, a, 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 an email from, from Time Magazine would have put me on a plane out of here, right? But, but, but those, those days are over. I think, um, uh, you know, one thing about ISU I think that I, I, I like the most is for the first time in my career, I feel like I'm serving the American people in, in the largest way I can instead of just the interest of, of one agency coming out of the CIA and, and the Department of Justice. And it, it's a tremendous honor, but it's also a, a, a uh, it sounds trite, but it's true, a, a huge uh, responsibility. And I can only be as good as, as you all uh, need me to be. And that, and that means, uh, again, to reach out to us, to let us know when we're doing things that, that you don't necessarily approve of or, or that you don't like. I mean, it doesn't mean that we'll, <laughs> we'll necessarily change, but it, it will be useful to hear criticisms. Uh, we're not afraid of that. We work for the government and we work for the American people. And ultimately, you know, I, I wouldn't call some of you our clients because, again, we're the umpire in the game. But I'd like to know if you think the umpire strike zone is too wide or if you think it's too small. 
Right? This isn't the Black Sox of 1919. Right? So anyway, I, I hope you'll have an uh, interesting day today. Uh, we're going to have some first-rate presentations from Mr. Scarrat over here and, and also from Mr. Riddle on our CUI program. These are two of our best uh, people. Again, I've got many, many best people, but th these are two of, of, of my, uh, my crown jewels. So um, I hope you sit back and enjoy what you hear. And again, if there's anything you don't understand or um, you know, want amplified or we can do better as a director of ISU, I would, uh, would like to know because ultimately, you know, one agency, one group, one office uh, is really nothing. You know, this is a, a, a big, big field we're playing on and uh, we need ideas, we need constructive thoughts, we need uh, to be able to, I think, honor our mission, which, which again is to protect this country to our highest uh, ability, but also to make sure that the American people believe in us, that they have faith in our ability to do this. You know, I, it, 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 it's no good if people don't. You know, if, if we've lost the confidence of the people we work for, then what's the point? I, I, I can't frankly see any. So. With that attitude, you know, I hope we can go forward in, in a very fulsome and vigorous partnership and begin to tackle some of these issues. Because I can tell you, quite frankly, no one else really is. So it's up to us, and particularly people in this room on both the government side and also the public interest side, to begin to ring the, uh, the bells on this. Because, again, I can't think of any better way to preserve our democracy than what we're doing in this room. Thank you very much. Again, everybody. I need this keyboard. Okay, hopefully that was a fun uh, networking break. Um, right now, we're going to jump into our panel discussion. Uh, leading our panel is Bob Squarat. Bob serves as the project lead for the annual agency self inspection reporting to ISU. He is team lead for ISU on site reviews and lead for ISU support to state, local, tribal, and private sector policy advisory committee. He's a busy guy. Uh, he's been a member of the ICU staff since 2001, prior to which he served as a researcher with, okay, here we go, the Nazi War Crimes and Japanese Imperial Government Records Interagency Working Group, uh, as a, also as a senior researcher with the Presidential Advisory Commission on Holocaust Assets in the United States, and, timely as today's headlines, Chief Analyst for CIA Records with the JFK Assassination Records Review Board. So. When you read it all, he helped out. Uh, Bob holds a BA in history from LaSalle University and an MA in history from Villanova. Ladies and gentlemen, Bob Scarrat. Thank you, thank you. Good morning and, and, and welcome. Um, I'd like to introduce the, the members of my panel here. Sitting next to me is Randy Akers, uh, an Information Security Program Manager from the Department of the Air Force. Um, Christine Wright, Information Security uh, Specialist. Uh, officer, I'm sorry, from the Office of Personnel Management, Greg Schaub, uh, Chief of Classification Management uh, from the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, and uh, Chris Zabel, from an Information Security Specialist from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Um, the topic for our panel is self-inspections. Um, and, you know, usually at the open house, um, you know, I have a session where I come and talk about um, self-inspections, and, and I figured you guys are probably tired of hearing me, so I, I invited these folks who, who you know, we, we, we've gotten reports from their agencies as we have from yours, and, and they've given us good reports, and, and in many cases we've gone to the agencies and seen that they have good programs. And so, you know, we, we'd like to give them the opportunity to talk about what they do, and, um, you know, I know there are other folks out there who have good programs and, and you know, you could be sitting here just as well as they could. Um, and maybe some, some year we may call on you to help us. Um, but, but um, you know, the, the self-inspections, it's a topic that's, I think, on a lot of people's <laughs> minds right now. Uh, I hope it is, because the, um, the uh, report to ISU is due next week. Um, so, um, you know, it, it, it's timely in that it's all on your mind. Um, but, 
you know, if, if, if you get some good, good ideas out of this, it's, it's, it's something that would be ap applicable more likely to get next year's uh, uh, self-inspection activity than, than this year's. Um, and of course, you know, self-inspection is a very, very important part of your program. You know, it's how you oversee your classified program. Um, and, and, you know, self-inspections help you identify strengths and weaknesses and, and help you determine where to focus your resources to make improvements. Um, um, Self-inspections have been required in the classified program for some time. Um, they were acquired by EO 10290, that's 1951, and by many executive orders after that. Um, EO 12958 added the requirement to review your classified product as part of your self-inspections, and the, the de detailed self-inspection reporting you now do um, was added in 2009 by EO 13526. Um, so that self-inspection self reporting um, has, has drawn attention and, and I think has led to improvements in, in, in many self-inspection programs. Um, and many of those programs are very good, um, but there are still some that need improvement. So, so that's why we're doing this today. Um, you know, so, so to you know, let you hear from these folks and, and, and see if you might take away some ideas that can help you if, if there are things you need to, um, to, to, to um, beef up in, in your self-inspection programs. So for the next hour or so, uh, you'll hear a discussion of how, how these, these, these folks implement their self-inspection programs. And, and um, you know, be, be, before we do this, I would like to ask each of the panelists to, to uh, introduce themselves, tell, tell, tell us about what they do at their agencies, um, how long they've been involved in, in the, the self-inspection programs at their agencies, um, have there been any change in those programs in that time, and if there are one or two things they might want to highlight about the programs, and, this is, and then we'll go into our panel discussion. So, so Randy, could, 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 uh, could you start? Sure, good morning everybody. Uh, I've been with the Air Force since uh, 1977. I've actually been involved with the self-inspection program since 1982. That was my first stint in information security. And ever since then, I've kind of grown through all the different uh, various legs of self-inspection or inspection processes from being in an organization up to uh, an installation inspector onto a MAGCOM and now at the Air Force where I write policy for the information security program. And that's where I got my starts at. And one of the biggest things that I've seen evolution-wise is how we are starting to leverage in the Air Force technology to develop these reports. And we'll share more about that in a little bit. All right, thank you. I'm Christine Wright. I've been at OPM since 2006. I've been involved in the Information Security Office uh, since 2008 doing self-inspections. Our program there is the self-inspection program is an important tool used to identify, um, self-evaluate and identify deficiencies. It actually helps us to update our annual security awareness training based on the findings and deficiencies we find during the self-inspection. I think the self-inspection program should be a valuable tool to all agencies. Thank you, Christine. Um, Greg? Yeah, hi, Greg Schaub, uh, ODNI. Uh, I've been in the intelligence community now for a little over 24 years. It's hard saying that but uh, uh, both uh, supporting uh, as, as a government employee and prior to that as a, uh, a contractor supporting multiple uh, classified programs where I was on the other end of, of uh, inspections, um, just like the annual self-inspection that we do here. Uh, I, would, I, would, I would highlight what you said with regards to leveraging uh, technology now uh, with regards to you know, the inspection program, um, uh, you know, just to get a better product. Yeah, well, great, thank you. And, and Krista? Good morning, good morning everyone. My name is Krista Zabel, and as Bob mentioned, I'm with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. I've been with the NRC for nine years, but involved with the self-inspection program for about four years. Uh, we've had had significant changes over the past few years. Uh, specifically, we've reformatted our program a little bit, and we'll talk about the tools we use a little bit later. Um, but more directly answering the requirements that ISU wants during our detailed report at the end of each year. Um, and I echo also your sentiments about technology. Uh, also is using it as a tool to help us with our reporting. 
but we're also looking at technology in the future as we look at documents that reside electronically, how we're reviewing those records and our self-inspection. All right, well, great. Thank you, everybody. So, so again, this is a panel discussion. So I will raise a topic and, or ask a question, and the panel will discuss it. Um, you'll likely recognize many of the topics because they're ones that you cover in your self-inspection reports. Um, and I'll ask the audience to hold questions until the end of the discussion. Um, but if you have questions for each other, please ask. Um, so the first question, um, uh, what is the value of self-inspection program to your agency's broader classified national security information? I know that uh, Christine already spoke to that in, in her introduction. So is one of the uh, one of you others want to start with this? Mm -hmm. So the biggest value that we get out of it in, in the Air Force is number one is, is to identify policy gaps. Are we, um, one of the biggest things too is, is concerning administration. When we look at our policies and the way we do security for protecting our national security assets, we ask ourselves when we put into policy, is this an administrative burden? And we really watch administration and seeing how we can remove or leverage technology to get administration out of the program. Another thing too is uh, we look at the policy, the compliance, and we also look at ways we can uh, leverage the risk management process to, to start focusing more on a risk-based uh, process for protecting the assets. And at the same time, how do we uh, leverage risk management and make sure that commanders are compliant with the executive order as well. So that's, that's the biggest things that we leverage out of this is looking at gaps and how we can maneuver our policy to, to more of a technology and risk-based framework. Now, I think to your point too of looking for gaps is, 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 is it significant, uh, particularly with, with us, you know, with, with the workforce and, and where we're possibly falling short with regards to education um, and, uh, you know, how we can, uh, based on that, how we can uh, improve our program through uh, increased uh, awareness, uh, looking at our, we've developed a uh, uh, online training module for, uh, and, and added things that obviously were, were uh, uh, limiting uh, in our program, and uh, that's proved to be very, very good. Um, so uh, uh, again, uh, that's all I have right now. Okay. And I'd echo that too with regard to training and education, um, specifically with the document reviews and interviews of derivative classifiers during the self-inspection program. Uh, we get a better understanding of what maybe is the fundamental disconnect. Is it they don't understand the marking requirement? They don't understand application of a class guide? And then we can tailor our training accordingly. Do they need um, examples of practical exercises or do they just need to see um, more of the marking requirements, maybe in the ISOO marking guide or something right. like that. And, and that reminds me, one of the things that we do, I think is the best practice, we review in, um, in many cases documents that are going out for, um, for d d dissemination from the ODNI. So we have subject matter experts in place there doing real-time reviews. And when we can do that, we can pass along immediately to our users, uh, our derivative classifiers, what they have done correctly or wrong, and at the same time catch any issues before things go out the door. That's proved to be very, very uh, beneficial uh, for our program. I also think that having a close working relationship with your senior agency official is a value. Yeah, I couldn't stress that enough. I mean, if you don't, I mean, I think it's obvious, but it's something that I think sometimes goes unnoticed. If you don't have support from, from your top leadership, uh, you're certainly not going to be successful. Um, you know, and having their support and being able to go to them, ask for additional resources mm -hmm. uh, because of issues that have, that have come up based on the self-inspection, being able to show that and having that support is, is paramount to a successful program. Um, I'm fortunate uh, from, from an ODNI perspective, our chief management officer has, has been very, very supportive to the program. And uh, that, that I think has, has gone a long way in, uh, in, in uh, having us have a very successful program. But I, I, you know, again, I can't stress that enough. And I think Bob and his team, uh, you know, leveraging them on your out briefings, um, I think is, is, you know, is, is a really good idea. So to try to get those out briefings at the most senior level so your leadership can understand, you know, the importance of this and what we're doing and just how important it is. And going back to what, uh, you know, Mr. Bradley's remarks on, you know, we're overclassifying, uh, you know, we're not 
uh, doing things correctly to ensure proper information protection and more importantly, information sharing and then ultimately declassification and sharing with the public. Great, great. And, and this is actually a good segue to the next question. Uh, next question is about responsibility because the order and the directive uh, are very clear that self-inspections are the uh, senior agency officials program, right? So the SAO is responsible for directing and administering that, that self-inspection program. And, and also the SAO determines the means and methods for self-inspections, establishes the coverage requirements, and, and sets the format for documenting self-inspections. Uh, and of course, the senior agency official submits the annual report on the self-inspection program to the director of ICE. Um, so my question for the panel is how does your senior agency official direct and administer the self-inspection program? And who wants to start? We're at OPM. Our senior okay. agency official ensures that adequate resources are allocated. He also ensures that any identified deficiencies we find during the self-inspections are addressed. I would add to that, uh, you know, our senior agency official has been uh, very supportive in that, uh, you know, making our workforce aware of the importance of the annual inspection, um, making and signing off on um, a uh, ODNI wide information notice that you know the, the, an inspection will be coming up. He fully supports it. These are the things that are going to be looked at and evaluated, and for everyone to give uh, you know utmost uh, uh, support to the inspection team. And of course. Having that workforce uh, awareness is, is, is paramount uh, to you know, the team being able to acquire the data that they need uh, so we can better understand where we're, where we're lacking and where we need to improve. So again, that, that support is, is there and has been very instrumental. Similarly at the NRC, um, we see you know, our senior agency official endorses the policies and procedures for the self-inspection, the annual self-inspection report. Um, but also fundamentally, the senior agency official when we have deficiencies that we identify or findings, they don't see it as a negative. Um, they see it as an opportunity for improvement, which really helps the whole entire program. So the offices that we're going and reviewing, they don't see us as trying to find something. Just like ICE do when they come out on their on-site review, we always see it as opportunities for improvement. That really starts at the senior agency official level. Now, I think that's, that's a great point. And I think, obviously, we're, we would be doing ourselves a disservice if we thought our program was perfect. Absolutely. Right? So if, if we didn't find things that we needed to improve upon and be able to take those to our, to our senior officials and then, like you said, have that support to address those is key, again, to successful program. Yeah, and within the Air Force, uh, I think alignment is very, very important. And in the Air Force, we've uh, come a long way, uh, especially since 2008. Uh, we are directly aligned to the senior agency official. Uh, we're a three-letter directorate. We're the Security, Security Program, and Information Pro, uh, Protection <coughs> Oversight Division. And we sit right underneath our senior agency official, so we have direct access to it. Our senior agency official also signs out our information security policy that, that directs the, uh, the implementation of the self-inspection program as well as the uh, classification management program. And she's also uh, taking it on to our major commands. So if you kind of look at the Air Force, we have about 10 to 14 major commands. So she talks directly to the major commanders who talk directly to the installation commanders. <coughs> so we're aligned directly underneath her and under the senior agency official. And then the people we talk to are underneath and sit on the staffs at our major commands. These are our oversight folks. And at the installation level, those information security people sit on the installation commander staff. So there's, first of all, very structured alignment. And then the policy directing the implementation of the program requires it, especially at the installation level, for the information security to go visit every organization on the installation, whether they are assigned directly to the installation commander or if they're a tenant. And those organizations get inspected uh, every year, at least once, uh, by the Information Protection Office, where our InfoSec personnel and industrial security, they go out as a team, as a, in fact, and they, they help develop this report uh, at, ins at each installation. So when you think about it, within the Air Force, if you've got 14 commands and each command has 10, ins uh, 10 installations, which is roughly right, and uh, on each installation you've got anywhere from 40 to 80 security managers, 
that's the workforce that we have deployed out to make sure that our assets are properly protected in a national security environment. It's a very large force. And I'll tell you, in one command, where we do a lot of acquisition, we have over 2,000 080 security professionals deployed in that command just to protect our critical information for the Air Force. That's amazing. That's a lot. That's amazing. So that answers kind of the question. How do you get those numbers, Randy? Uh, Absolutely, yeah. And, <laughs> and we'll talk about your numbers with the document review a, a little bit later on. Um, well, well, thank you all for, for that. Uh, the next topic is approach. So uh, what are the means and methods employed in conducting self-inspections at your agency? Ours is primarily checklist driven. I will, I'll tell you right now today, ours are, my, are primarily checklist driven with sampling. So, and, and not only that, uh, I think you hit a very good point. Our information security people, when they go out and they're doing inspections of, of the information security program on installation, they are not only the information security person doing oversight, they are also that trainer. So when people have questions, they're having one-on-one -on -one interaction with people who are in open storage areas, who are in SCIFs, who are in uh, uh, working around security containers, who are doing derivative classifications. And when they inspect, they don't just go in and inspect with an I got you attitude. They go in and inspect with I'm here to help you make this program better. I'm here to help your job easier so that you're not getting picked on or picked at when it comes to inspection time by our inspector general. And that's another important part. Our entire program is aligned under the Air Force Inspector General inspection system as well. So that's our approach. It's, uh, it's, it's very detailed. Uh, like I said, we're only taking one look a year at every organization, but under the inspection uh, inspector general, they actually have to do a couple assessments a year and we, as the policy writers, decide what those organizations are going to inspect through what we call a management internal control tool set. It's a technology where, as a policy writer, I have to provide a communicator to every commander who owns, processes, or handles classified information so that they can go through a step-by-step -step and do it within their own organization, a self-assessment. And that counts as one of the two. And when we go out, that counts as their second. So. Uh, we're, we're really tied in tight to our Air Force uh, inspection system. And I'll jump on. We also use a checklist. We actually send the checklist out prior to going out to do the site visit. And I myself conduct the inspections, and we also provide additional training for some of the deficiencies we found prior to going out to inspections. So sometimes we have to do semi-annual inspections. We do them more than once a year, depending on the deficiencies we find. OD&I, uh, you know, a little bit smaller in nature. Uh, I would offer you from an approach perspective, uh, where we meet people at the door, meaning on their EOD, we, we, have, full, uh, we have a full uh, briefing program that we give as people come in about classification, um, classification markings, handling information. We're also set up a little bit differently in that classification management is separate from security. So we partner very, very closely with our security uh, team uh, to uh, work with them, again, from a checklist approach, where we're deficient, uh, uh, where we need work. Uh, we also offer uh, training sessions as required. We go out to our chiefs of staff, and at any time, if they would like to have additional training, we're, we're there to, uh, uh, to offer that. Um, one of the things that the ODNI has also tried to do is, is public face a little bit more across the IC. And we will, uh, I will go and we will train at uh, special security officer training sessions on derivative classification, classification markings, and, and overall. And that's a, a, a part of an overall security uh, uh, program uh, that, that takes into consideration all disciplines. But again, we're trying to get forward facing uh, as well as inward facing with regards to our, our personnel uh, so we, you know, we can address these issues uh, you know, from an overall approach perspective on how we're doing our, our program. Similarly, <clears throat> excuse me, the NRC also does have um, uh, several tools and checklists that we use as part of our prescriptive procedure for conducting self-inspections. Uh, because of resource constraints, actually, if a entity has a successful self-inspection in fiscal year A, um, the next fiscal year, we might give them the tool and have one of the security inspectors at that location actually administer their self-inspection, and then we'll bring the reports back up to headquarters and have our senior agency official 
um, review those as well. We'll follow up on any corrective actions if they have them, but it has helped us um, utilize our tool better, um, but also our assets out in our other facilities. If I could, from an approach perspective too, I mentioned it earlier, but I think one of the things that, that really serves us well is having embedded subject matter experts and in our front offices as products come through, we're able to recognize trends right off the bat. So that's, that's been very, very beneficial and it helps us uh, address issues of concern um, you know, immediately, almost on a real-time basis. And as we do those reviews, we also collect that, that data for our inspection. Uh, for, for our figures with regards to, to issues. Um, and again, I think uh, that, that serves us very, very well, again, in, in um, uh, being able to foresee issues as they're coming along and being able to address them in real time, um, as opposed to you know, once a year as we're doing our self-inspections. My point is it's continuous. It's continuous, and that's proved to be quite beneficial. And lastly, uh, I mean, not, lastly, Christine may have something here, but I. I want to emphasize uh, a management internal control tool kit that we do have. It's a tool, it's used by the IG, it is a technology system. And any time uh, I can pinpoint a question and go into that system and query on just that question to see how the organizations are answering. Mm -hmm. And our, the way we do our communicators is that if you're using our communicator, there's no reason, first of all, for you to have a not applicable to that. So if somebody were to answer, for example, uh, are, you, are you closing the security containers daily and open them properly, document whatever, and somebody goes, not applicable. <laughs> you know, we're probably going to pick, the, we pick the phone up and actually call the organization and said, uh, did you hit the wrong button? What happened here? What's <laughs> going on? So we have an opportunity to have a dialogue directly straight down from the Pentagon, straight down to the installation where there may be an issue going on. And when we talk to them, if there really is an issue going on, we, we say, what can we do to help? Do you need our assistance? And, and at that point in time, they got our staff. I, I just can't overemphasize uh, on our staff. We have at least 12 people. Is that about right, Jennifer, 12? And they are all generalists, OADOs, in info, personnel, industrial. We can come up with some great ideas. And the OUSDI has a great staff to help those commanders down at the, at the very operational level to get to success. And that's what we're there to do, is try to get them to success. And, because uh, they get graded in the Air Force. Their promotions are based upon the grades they get in these various programs. And, and uh, if it's a graded area, which information security is a graded area for the Air Force, uh, they, they wanna make sure they're doing the right thing and getting the program squared away. So it's an opportunity using that technology to be able to reach all the way down to a very low-level airman and say, what's going on in your organization? We're seeing something here. How can I help you? And we can reach down and do that from the, from the air staff. Oh, that sounds like a great tool. Yes. It's a great tool. Well, we got one yes. better coming up, so. Oh, I need to get that. Okay, next up um, is the representative sample of classified documents. Um, uh, it's uh, it's one of particular importance uh, because the, the error rate that, that ISU finds when we do our on-site reviews is often, often very high. Um, at individual agencies, we've seen it um, as high as 90% um, and as low as 12%. So, so you know, it, it can be good too. Uh, but most often, um, these error rates fall between 60 and 70%. So, uh, the review of classified documents needs particular attention during self-inspections. Um, uh, and there are several questions uh, under this topic. Um, so we'll start. How do you identify the activities at offices where documents are included in the sample of classified uh, information? I'll go ahead and start on that one. Um, while the NRC doesn't have, we don't have the staff right now to review every decision as it comes in, we are requiring our staff to report them to us as they come in. Um, so we do have a database that we query uh, prior to conducting our self-inspections for a given fiscal year to see where are the activities occurring. It actually um, has the data down to the classifier level. So if someone's doing a lot of activity, we might reach out to them for an interview. Um, so that's how we, and then we do a statistical sampling of that information. So one of the biggest things is, like I said with the Air Force, we're a very large 0080 community. 
So almost every one of our original classification, I will say, I, I'll go out on a limb and say every one of our original classification authorities actually has a 0080 sitting on their staff. And so whenever they make an original classification authority that's documented, and it's either, uh, of course, the, the, the security person sitting there doing the one, two, three at the same time, but it's also documented right then and there, and they, they immediately update security class guides. Uh, very rarely do we have classification decisions pushed out by memorandum, but having an 080 uh, directly available and on the staff, that's where we get the bang for the buck at. And, and not only that, they have uh, very big teams to help them get through the six step process for making a classification decision. And if for one, any, any reason whatsoever, and we've helped uh, the OCAs with this as well, they can reach out to our staff and we provide them guidance and assistance in getting there. And I'll give you a good example. There was a program and they were looking through a database and one of our information security person says, wow, this is not classified. How can this information not be classified? And they went to an organization that didn't have an OCA but was gonna have to work with their original classification authority and they reached out to our staff and we were able to sit down, teach them the six step process, help them walk through to get to the decision. Now, fortunately, uh, for the original classification authority, this did not uh, mature to a classification decision, but they realized they had some sensitive information, some CUI that they weren't adequately protecting and marking. So that's the kind of uh, assistance. You just gotta be in a, that assistance role where you're willing to help or be able to leverage people in the community, whether in your organization or outside your organization, to, to help you get the success that you're looking for. Don't try to do it alone. It's a good point to dovetail off, you know, within the ODNI, no OCA decisions are made without uh, subject matter expertise from classification management as well as a uh, true subject matter expert on the data before an OCA decision is made. Uh, and I would offer you from a best practice perspective, uh, in our technological uh, programs in IARPA, uh, on a semi-annual basis, we're reviewing those classification guides for any updates before you know, additional OCA decisions are made. And I think that's, that's proved to be very, very beneficial. But again, these just aren't made one-offs. You know, it's very collaborative, it's across the board, and uh, uh, it's proved to be very successful. I just wanna ask real quick, is there anybody from NGA here? NGA? If you know anybody over in the NGA, they got a great system, they call it, it's called the Conga. And uh, that system, Took some, it's some legwork to get it up and running, but it's on a, uh, it's on a SharePoint type system, whether it's on a classified at the JWIX zipper or it can have an unclass uh, perspective, but they got all their OCA decisions are made on one class guide and depending on the subject area, their OCAs are assigned to various subject areas. So if you need a classification decision made, uh, in, in the NGA, you got to find that OCA and you got to go to that OCA and work with specifically with that OCA. It's an awesome system. Uh, we, the Air Force, we like it, but we are very large when it comes to our 500 security class guides to try to make that down into one. But mm. if you're small enough, we, you can definitely get it down there and it's some legwork, but I would highly re recommend you reach out to NGA and managing your classification decisions because they got an awesome system. Well, we're a medium agency, but a small classification program. We're not an OCA, so mo majority of ours is through derivative classification. So that's where our program lies within program offices, organizations that handle, generate, and process classified information. But we're derivative classifiers, basically. And just to add some context to NRC's program, what I was mentioning earlier was majority derivative classification as well. We are an OCA, but we do very little original classification. Like half the agency is gonna know if we do one, so. <laughs> Uncommon. Y'all got any openings? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, especially for, for agencies like yours, Randy, and, and, and yours, Greg, you know, how do you determine the offices you go to to, to, to draw these classified documents? Uh, well, what we do is uh, generally we have our large components and we're going to reach out to them each, each year because of the amount of derivative decisions they're making and, and uh, the, the products that they're producing. Um, some of the smaller rates we might do every other year. Um, but again, it's, we want to go where the, the majority of the decisions are being made from a classification, uh, a derivative classification perspective. 
um, because that's where more than likely there are going to be issues and we're going to want to address those and find any of those trends that I talked about earlier. Um, so uh, that's how we, 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 and we do that on an every other year basis. So some of the smaller we might do every other year, but the larger we're going to do every year to, uh, again, get a very good assessment of where most of the derivative decisions are being made. Oh, so we have uh, approximately 86 original classification. We have 86 original classification authorities in the Air Force, and they're done by program offices. So uh, the way we know how to reach out to them is we have the listing, and the users know because the title springs right from their uh, original classification authority designation. So if you needed something with the F-16 office, you know where to go in, in the Air Force to the to the 83 and who that original classification authority is. And the acquisition program is, of course, in the Air Force is very large. And uh, our program office is uh, fortunate for Jennifer and I. We don't even have to know who the OCA is. We just need to know it's an acquisition piece. And we get it to that MAGCOM, and they know right away which office is going to lead the efforts on making any original classification authority decisions. Now, um, I, I, I do want to mention that um, you know, when we get Air Force's report every year, we're, we're, we're uh, pretty amazed at the numbers that you um, indicate you've reviewed for uh, the classified products. So 2016, it was over 93,000. Correct. Um, and how do you do that? <laughs> yeah. I mean, seriously, how do you review 93,000 yeah. products? It, it's called 2,300 security specialists that are out there documenting and doing that. That's Makes how you sense. do that. Makes sense, you got that, okay. Yeah, so, and, and so that's, that's the way they do that. And also during the inspection process, the first thing they do is they look at you, and then they look at a sample of derivative products. We have millions and millions and millions of derivative products. There's no way we'd be able to go. If you just take the email piece in the Air Force, you definitely couldn't even, uh, you wouldn't even have a place to start. But when those info, information security managers when they walk in, they know they have to sample 20% of the products. They walk into their organizations. They know what products those organizations uh, uh, produce. You know they're going to go straight for the email. If they're on a SIPR or a JWIC system, they're going to go straight after that. They're going to have somebody pull up their scent file, and they're going to take 20% of that scent file and start reviewing are they marking and properly processing the documentation. And it's totally flawless, and you believe that, right? <laughs> Right. Email is just a challenge. Uh, so, you know, we, we've taken a lot, and I just, you know, I like to speak about that uh, when we're over the shoulder and we're doing those reviews of email. We, we've taken a step-by-step -step approach. You know, the first thing is, if you print something up, we like, we like for our people to print something up. And if you print it up off the printer and you pick it up off the printer, would you be able to tell if there's classified information in there? Is the top and the, let's start with the basic. Is the, is the top and the bottom marked? Is there some way that you can definitely tell? So we got through that, prior, making sure that they were using the marking tool. And then we just went by making a nice little email cheat sheet that's uh, provided by CDSC. Uh, they have a nice little, uh, in their training program, you mm -hmm. can pull it up and they set it right by their computer so that if they really do gotta get down to a technical document of some sort, uh, email to mark, they got every little step on how to do it, including their attachments and so forth. So it's that one-on-one. -on -one. We, because we have a large security force, have that opportunity to do that. You may mm -hmm. not be able to do that. You just gotta be creative and using the visual aids and then inspect what you expect and be realistic about what you expect. Bob, a little bit more about approach. I know it's more of how we, how we choose, mm -hmm. but as far as a, a cross-section of documents, you know, uh, we, we soup the nuts. Emails, uh, we look at our uh, um, uh, classified um, um, DAPs or disseminated analytical product that are on wire. Uh, so these are true uh, a sampling of products that are out there, emails spreadsheets, uh, you name it. We take a sampling of everything. We don't limit it to a particular type of, of uh, product, such as email, um, and, we, and we look at all that. And it's, and it's, it's, it's just a, uh, a collection of those, of, of the different types of products that we're looking at. And we don't focus on anything, any one thing in particular, because again, we want to get the broad picture of what's going on. 
And particularly when you think about, you know, email is critical, but when we're talking about disseminating a local product, what's going out to our customers to make decisions, we want to ensure, you know, we're going to pay particular attention to those to ensure those are marked and classified properly. Um, and again, looking for those trends on where we can go and we can help uh, from a uh, uh, annual training perspective, et cetera. So again, it's a, it's a large cross section of the products that we produce within the ODNI. And we also look at it a little bit further as well as we, are there trends outside of that as well. Well, being at OPM and being small, I actually do 100% document review of actually physically looking at documents that's on hand. I do a sampling of electronic um, classification documents, also ensuring that our Intel community are marking them correctly so that I don't have my folks doing what they do and I'm gigging them and they're using, well, I received this email this way. That's not the way you do it. So, 2014, when I started writing the policy for the Air Force on information security, the policy at the time was about 10 years old. Uh, one of the documents that I use for our local, I call them our installation security people to identify the different documents, is I actually use the ISU uh, instructions. Marking booklet? The actual the instructions that they send out for the self-inspection and okay. for the data calls. And by using that instruction, uh, the, the local folks know what products are produced. They know if they got engineers and whether they need to be looking at working papers and if they need to be looking at technical documents. They know if they got briefers. Uh, mission briefers, so they need to be looking at more PowerPoint slides. They know what documents to look at, but that ISU instruction became and is placed right into our Air Force policy. Now, I want to be, you got to be a little careful because not every year they're going to look for the same thing. So look at the stuff that's going to be very general. You know every year when that instruction comes out, either in classification management or in the uh, self-inspection, those things are pretty much standard and that you can capture or what needs to be, if you're going to use it as a policy, make sure it's a policy. I would recommend today if I was doing it over, and uh, we talked to Ms. Skelton, who's in the process of redoing some policy for us, is to take that instruction and make it as a guide uh, for self-inspections and for your folks who are doing self-inspections uh, and what they should be looking for. I'm glad you brought the instructions as well, because in addition to the self-inspection instructions, we also use the 311 instructions. I don't know if uh, anyone from DOE is here, but the NRC deals with some restricted data, and uh, ISU, they don't, under the executive order, they're not looking to, for us to review those documents. Now, the NRC does, because we still want those marked properly as well, uh, but in terms of self-inspections, for our self-inspection report, we're going to place a higher emphasis on the national security information documents, and that has changed over time, because prior to, I would say, the past 10 years, we were looking at both types of documents together and our self-inspection report didn't delineate them as well. And that's a good point because being a mil military department, we look at all information and treat it in a report all as the same. So we take the restricted data and if we need to report on restricted data, we will as well as foreign government information, NATO, and any other type of information because we look at it as one whole product and mm -hmm. one process even though there might be splits in executive order for reporting. Great, great, a lot, a lot, of, lot of good discussion here. Um, one more question about um, the review of the classified products. How do you record and track the findings of your, your document review? Ours is, if I could, uh, as I mentioned, we, uh, we're looking, we're in those front offices, we're doing these reviews in real time, and we accumulate that data essentially in a spreadsheet. Um, and so we're able to, you know, again, in real time, see where trends are going. And we take it exactly from the self-inspection report on what type of errors we're looking. It's part of the spreadsheet. We do a review. We put that information immediately in the spreadsheet. And again, at any given time, we can see trends. Is it errors with the block? Is it errors with portion markings, overclassification, underclassification? And we can start to see those things. Um, pleased to report, very rarely do we see overclassification. Um, so that's a good thing, but um, you know, again, um, the, 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 the declassification on block, because we will know if that date is, if it says it's supposed to be 25 years and it's not, we can immediately catch that and see that as a trend. Um, so again, it's nothing super fancy, and based on our size, we're able to do that, but you know, with particular formulas in each one of those cells within an Excel spreadsheet, as we do each review in real time, we're able to put that data in there and again, see, what, see what's happening on a daily basis. 
The NRC is also using a checklist spreadsheet. Ours is shockingly similar to the one ISO uses. <laughs> so if they've done an on-site review recently, I would recommend asking them for what theirs looks like so you can mimic it because it's very helpful. <laughs> and I'll tell you, the Air Force, uh, at the installation level, every time they go visit a unit, the Information Protection Office has to write and develop a detailed uh, report on their findings. Uh, most of our installations, of course, they're not going to have original classification, but they, they all have derivative, they all have safeguarding, security violations, management and oversight of their program. So they are still writing reports today uh, for every site they go visit and they track any kind of classification decisions that they may find in those actual reports and then they feed it into data cause. I would love to tell you that they're tracking it by a spreadsheet, but I, I don't want to say that today. I, I know in the future they're going to have an awesome tool to be able to track some stuff for them and I, I'll be sharing that with the ISOO down the road Great. Uh, Great. on printing up and doing less data calls for our field on these reports because we're going to have a way to track, track them for them. Yeah, we can hear that, absolutely. At OPM, we use the checklist. From the checklist, we identify specific organizational deficiencies or findings, and we develop a written report based on the findings and recommendations to the senior agency official. All right, great, great, thank you all. Um, so actually, we're, we're already segueing into the next topic, which is reporting, uh, and that is, the qu first question is, what is your format for documenting documenting self-inspections? So for us, at every installation, every organization, they have to document it on, uh, they do individual reports for every unit that they, uh, they see. But they actually use, at the end of the year, they take all that data and they put it into the ISU reporting format and submit it to their MAGCOMs. And then they submit it up to us. And from there we do a complete analysis across all the Air Force to looking for trends and gaps in that process. Uh, I'll tell you today, because I, I have transitioned to a tool called the Enterprise Protection uh, Risk Management Tool, uh, that we are placing the self-inspection report that ISU has into a report for, format capturing. Uh, all of our assessment questions will be mirrored to one of the areas so that at the end of the year, I don't have to do a data call, I can just hit print and print our self-inspection report. So when we do get there in 18 months, we'll let ISU know. Please. Because there's a lot of programming to make that happen, but they definitely, the, the contractors have that in their hand to help us fill that out. And they got some very good ways. Really forward looking. Maybe. Yeah, it'd be a lot of fun. That gotta be costly. That's what costs a couple bucks. <laughs> uh, the Air Force has some RD and T money, some research development testing evaluation money that I found. It wasn't laying on the ground, but I did find it. <laughs> so at the NRC, we have a standard report template for a narrative portion. We also have a checklist that goes along with each report, and that does pull from the ISU self-inspection report field. Um, so while we don't have any automated tools that tell us at the end of the year, we do go to each of those checklists that are attached to the reports and we pull that data from it. Yeah, and we're small enough, we do the same thing. Yeah, we do the same thing too. Just pull from our checklist. But we'll gladly take that. I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next, how are the findings analyzed to determine if there are problems of a systemic nature? You know, that's just good old hard legwork for us. It's just sitting down with the, the standard you, you know, it's, it's the process, right? We all sit there and we do the standard analysis, analyze each one of these things to try to find the common trends to what we want to uh, identify as systemic issues within the Air Force. But we do work with the MAGCOMs because the major commands may have uh, systemic issues within their actual command because we're not all doing the same thing in the Air Force. We don't all fly, some of them train, uh, some of them equip, but so they have unique challenges in each of the different MAGCONs, but we're looking at a Air Force-wide to try to determine uh, systemic uh, issues. And literally, it is through uh, a, the process of 
let's load up everything that I seen in original in a spreadsheet and see what's common in original and that becomes our our reporting mechanism that's the way we do it and we literally add up all the numbers in the Excel spreadsheets the same exact way as probably most commands do hopefully we're not gonna have to be able to do that forever but uh, I, I think it's about time we move the process to a technology business solution as opposed to this manual process we've been doing for years <clears throat> well yeah. we're small sorry we can handle a manual process because we're not too many sites to inspect and so we can look at the trends and the deficiencies and kind of know what organization where they're going and how to correct those deficiencies we find and um, basically within our training that allows us doing the inspection when it's time for annual training to put what we found doing those inspections in that training sometimes we have to do additional one-on-one -on -one tabletop exercise no, that, that's a great point. It's one of the things that I was going to highlight as well. Again, it's, it's just, you know, really just looking at the numbers, the trends. But we, we're agile enough that we can uh, update our, uh, our um, web-based training uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a pretty quick manner to address those issues. Um, um, and also um, going out, and if there's individual programs that are, that are suffering in particular, we go out and uh, give them some one-on-one -on -one issues as well. Again, we're, we're large, but we're not that large that uh, that doesn't prohibit us from doing that. So that works out very, very well. But again, just old fashioned data analysis, if you will. It's there, and again, from our perspective, particularly on the markings and from a derivative perspective, we've got that real time so we can address those things pretty quickly. Uh, the NRC, we're small enough that we manually look at the data. Um, something to be said though is during the interviews, if someone tells us something, and you know, at least two people say it, they talk amongst each other, we're definitely gonna follow up on it because what the people are telling us is really where we're finding the trends are lying. Either where they need help um, or they don't understand application of guides, things like that. Um, so the interviews have proven very useful in finding those systemic problems. Right. That's a great point, you know, particularly during the interviews. You know, when we talk to individuals, <clears throat> you know, things get passed down, if you will, and it's not necessarily the right way to do things. <laughs> Um, and it, it's good that we could address that. That's a very, very good point. You know, uh, it's not always us, the professionals, that are getting the information out there. Sometimes it's just you know what somebody's been told, and so on and so on and so on. And you know, have, getting in there and being able to break that habit, um, or you know, that's the way it's always been done, and being able to address that. The interviews proved to be very, very helpful with regards to that. Great, great. So, and I will say, people are very forthcoming too. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if, if there's you know. Uh, uh, we, we send out a sampling where people can respond via email, and then we also do one-on-ones. And people aren't uh, hesitant to say, hey, this is you know, something that, that I haven't understood, or why do we do it like this? And you know, being able to address that is very, very helpful. That's really good. And I, I spoke a couple times about our IG system, but they also have what they call an IG evaluation management system, and they call that iGEMS. And that's where our IG teams actually can put data or findings into the system. With the IG system in the Air Force, you have, of course, the Air Force IG, and then you have the Air Force Inspection Agency, but all 14 MAGCOMs have an Inspector General team, and every installation has an Inspector General team. All of our information security personnel sit on one of those teams across the, uh, the Air Force. They can all load in various findings, what they're seeing, into iGEMS. And we will look at that database also to develop and see if there's any trends across the Air Force. And normally we do this a few times a year uh, to see if anything is coming up. I'll be honest, in the four years, I have not found any trends across the Air Force. It's been a lot of isolated onesies and twosies things that pops up and it's normally corrected right on the spot. And that's the advantage of having uh, a large security program because you got people there that can correct stuff right on the spot. Uh, all of our security professionals can correct classifications, markings, right on the spot. So that's that's a huge advantage for us uh, that some of the organ you know the agencies, federal agencies, may not have that type of advantage. Well, I want to comment on, on that, Randy. That that you know here you have this very very large department, and you and the security office, you can see what's going on in, in individual activities 
and the department as a whole, and, and that's what this is all about. So Yeah, so. we can go all the way down to that one little 50-person organization and see what they're doing down there on inspection. And that's just leveraging nicely. technology, yeah. and it wasn't cheap. Um, so the IG has done a really good job with uh, programming and setting that, uh, that, that technology in, in motion for us. And we're just fortunate to just jump on it and leverage it as policy writers. That's great, that's great. So the last thing about reporting, how do you determine if corrective actions are required? Again, I think like we talked a little bit earlier, you know, the whole reason for the, the self-inspection is to identify issues, okay? Um, and when you see these trends or you see issues that could be detrimental, corrective action is paramount and that's why it's there. That's why we do this and it's, it is, <coughs> I think we would all agree it's a large undertaking, but it's very, very important because it does highlight issues that need to be addressed. Um, and uh, you know, corrective action must be taken immediately. Uh, you know, we can't have issues with regards to this. This is national security information. Um, and uh, if corrective action is needed, it needs to be addressed immediately. Again, um, and I think it might be a little bit nuanced, but I think when we, we see when corrective action is needed, we know it. Um, it, it's, it's, it's quite, quite, uh, um, quite uh, evident, and um, you know, so therefore, you know, again, it's, it's addressed immediately. Yes. So for the right on the spot corrections, we don't document them other than the fact that uh, on spot corrections were made. But if we do see, or if at any level, if they see a systemic problem at an installation or at a MAGCOM, since all of our information security personnel are part of the inspection team, they can immediately write what they call an IGEMS finding, Inspector General Evaluation Management System finding. Uh, they, they work with the commanders to scope it properly, what the findings are, and then it's placed into that system. And then that system, IGEMS, is automated to the commanders and they have to continuously monitor that every 90 days and put in what they're doing to get to resolution. And some of them may take only 90 days, but there might be some uh, serious issues that, are, that may take a bit longer, but it's monitored on a 90-day basis just in that system. And that's the way uh, we actually get to uh, fixes across the installation, which is why we find very few systemic problems across the Air Force. And with, with regard to corrective actions, as you said, you know, I think it's evident sometimes what needs corrective action. That being said, sometimes you know we have to do interim corrective actions and then that long-term 90-day longer corrective action. Um, I know it's sometimes when the interim's in place, you, some people are like, oh, that's, that's good enough, but we really have to remember, and I know it's, it's sometimes a challenge for us to remember, um, you know, that we still need the resources, we need, still need to update the policy, which, which might be a longer effort, but uh, we need to follow through and do those things as well for the corrective action. And if so, I could, I'm sorry. No. If I could, what we talked about, you know, initially when we kicked this all off, there is, it's that support from that senior, senior agency official. Do we have a policy gap? If we do, it's addressed immediately and the policy is updated. I don't know about everybody else, but typically policy in the government can take a long time. But, you know, if you have the right people involved and they can address that, that quickly, <clears throat> all the better. So again, it goes back to having that, that, that senior agency of, uh, support. And that's what I will piggyback on, having that senior agency approval, that close working relationship when you identify the deficiencies, he's getting out there advocating what needs to be done. We have done a lot of corrections at LPM dealing with derivative classification, and we've done on-the-spot training that in there showing folks one-on-one. -on -one. I've actually when in one-on-one, -on -one, just sending emails back and forth to ensure that you're doing it correctly. I've posted stuff along the JWICS terminals. So we kind of correct it on the spot and ensure that those deficiencies don't happen the following year. We also got one other very powerful tool that we haven't had to leverage, and that's called a special interest item. Because our senior agency official is so hooked into our program and so close, and she gets briefings constantly on what's going on in information personnel industrial security. But it's also our IG system connecting that to that inspection process mm -hmm. that if we really had a serious issue where we really needed something mm -hmm. monitored, we can write what's called a special interest item and every IG team 
from the Air Force down to the installation, we'll inspect that item every year until there's resolution. And sometimes you would only write that if you don't understand a problem as well. Maybe you don't have enough to understand what's going on. So it's nice to have that tool in the toolbox. You want to use it cautiously, and you just got to understand when to use that. But we do have that authority to use special interest item uh, write-ups for the IG teams to uh, really focus on. Great, thank you so much. Uh, awesome. I want to piggyback yeah, on this conversation about corrective actions um, be, because um, th this is an issue for, for we see in, in, in our re reports we get each year that, that some agencies are identifying problems and not reporting corrective actions. And that may be that they are taking those actions and not reporting in, in the reports, but if, if indeed they are finding things and, and not fixing them, <coughs> Then, then that that is a big problem. So, so you know, in 2016, we found that 26 percent of the agencies didn't outline any corrective actions, even though they identified um, weaknesses. And uh, another um, 20 percent um, outlined corrective actions for some of of the the problems they identified. So, so you know, it's a big problem if if you invest your time and your resources. To do these self inspections and then don't fix things. So, so um, again, it may just be a reporting thing. I hope it is that. Um, but, 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 you know, use use the tools that you you developed and 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 and, and take advantage of, of the information you get. Um, so, so uh, on to the next topic. Uh, the, the the previous topics we talked about were were related to how you implement your self inspection program. Um, Next, we'll discuss ones that relate to reporting to ISU uh, on what you found. And so the first one has to do with the summary and assessment of findings. Um, so these are open-ended responses regarding what you found through your self-inspections and what these findings mean. Um, I should note that ISU is not looking perfect for perfection in these responses. Um, on the contrary, you know, if a report indicates there were no deficiencies in any program areas, we sometimes wonder how thorough your self inspection was. Um, again, as we've discussed many times through 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 the, the, the morning here, um, the purpose of self inspection is to identify deficiencies and correct them. Um, so, so regarding these questions about summary and assessment of findings, um, how do you determine what to include here, since they are open ended uh, responses? Well, the what, I'll tell you what I do. I, I mean, if I have a finding, I try to put it into some kind of context as, as to how is it relevant, but more importantly, where am I headed to, uh, to mitigate that finding? And I think it's, uh, if you're going to take the time to say, I, I found, we found this in the United States Air Force. For example, class, not all classification guides have been reviewed in the last five years. That was, that was found just this year. But at the same time, what happened this year? We had a fundamental classification guide review. So that, that fixed it. So you've got to be able to put everything in context. Yep, I know I found that. We found some of that. But at the same time, the assessment of that is we're good because of this fundamental classification guide review that we just did. And it may not require any corrective action other than the fact of that. So sometimes you've got stuff, or we all have things that we can find. But if you're going to document it, what does it really mean to your organization when you do document it? I wouldn't just document to, to put something in the block. And not every block needs something. But if you do, how does it relate? How does that issue relate to your organization? What, how do you feel about it? Is it really a, a systemic issue going on? And what are you doing to approach or fix it? What does the senior agency official think about it? So sometimes you have to get that input uh, before that, that final signature goes on that report. Again, at OPM, we're small. So the program is easy to identify the deficiencies and make recommendations for corrective actions. And usually the corrective actions are corrective because there's small deficiencies that we found. So through policy or through training, it gets done. 
like OPM, NRC small. So if it's noteworthy enough to put in one of our individual self-inspection reports, it's going to rise to ISU's report. Uh, my technical editors might be upset that it ends up in size 8 font on those form fillable. Um, but once they get over that, um, no, if it's noteworthy enough to be in an individual report, we'll put it in the overall self-inspection. I would say the same thing for us as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and how do you differenti differentiate between the summary and the assessment? I'll go ahead and start with this one, Bob. In some of our older reports, you would see that the summary and the assessment were nearly identical. Um, which we don't want. Um, so the summary, our interpretation, I think ISU is in agreement with on, is the statement of the facts, what we found, and then the mm -hmm. assessment is how that really impacts mm -hmm. your program. What does it mean if, if the corrective action is not there, but presumably we have one written in place, um, and, and how do we change that to correct the program and improve? Yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm I just have to bring our report with us, so I'll just go ahead and read, read one. <laughs> it's a little bit easier. And I know this is a common one. I mean, like I said, we all find it and we all, when we do an assessment, I do a couple things. I look at compliance and I look at risk. So uh, derivative classification, uh, some of the documents weren't properly marked, particularly email portions and classification authority blocks are not always annotated. Uh, what, do, what does that really mean to me at the end of the day, when you look at the program as a whole, this is kind of what I put just so that you, you understand where I was going with this. Classified information system is the primary email source for derivative classifiers. While some artifacts of marking are not always applied to email sources, documents contained, banner markings, and other control markings to alert the holder of information of its classification. Because when I think and I'm analyzing this and I'm looking, what is the purpose of marking, right? It's to alert the holder that they have some classified information in their hand. And I, I have a very good sense that if most folks who are doing the right thing know they have classified information, even if my paragraphs in this thing were not marked, they're probably not going to divulge or give this document to somebody that shouldn't have it. Uh, so that's kind of our assessment of what it is. And it says, and I went on to say, we have not experienced any security violations or unauthorized disclosure as a result of improperly marked email on our classified information system. So that tells our senior agency official, hey, we got some issues out there. These things are not, you're not gonna get it 100% compliance in the markings, but we haven't had or seen anything that's going to relate to unauthorized disclosure loss or a compromise of our classified based on the practices that are going on in the world. So that's just kind of the way I summarized that up, just to give you an example. So just to interject, the other side of the coin is if, if the, those portions aren't marked, then it does make it difficult to, to share that information. It does, and it makes it very difficult to, to share, and our folks realize that when they, they have documents. I think that my biggest, how many of you get data spillages? I mean, you're not telling the truth. <laughs> so, but data spillages, we find a lot of times, come from the cipernet. People taking stuff from the cipernet that's not marked, even top and bottom, and then they try to put it onto a nippernet. And they put a paragraph or into an email, and they send it to somebody, and then somebody goes, that's classified. And sure enough, it's classified. So you're right. It kills information sharing. It doesn't alert everybody in those paragraph markings uh, at the top, and the, at least the top and the bottom. As I said, it was a very slow approach. I figured if I can get them to mark the tops and the bottoms and the emails themselves to alert folks, they wouldn't do it. And it significantly cut down on our data spillages. People with printed documents stopped taking stuff off of classified emails and uh, putting it onto our nipper nets. Now if I can just get them to stop putting a disc in, I'll be, that'd be nice. Marking the disc, I should say. Mm -hmm. All right, well thank you. Uh, the, the next topic is about the focus questions. Uh, you know, those data-centric responses to questions about training, performance evaluations, OCA delegations, classification challenges, industrial security. Um, so how do you gather and, and, and how do you obtain the data for this section? So ours is in policy. 
So let me do derivative classification. Uh, at least once a year, the installations, they'll go over to the communication squadron, which is at the installation level serves as CIO A6. And they will get with the folks there and they will identify all the people on the installation that have access to JWIX and to CIPRNET for them. And from there they will take a sample and those individuals will be responsible for recording the deriv derivative classification and submitting them to the office. And I would say a few years ago, they were doing this four times a year. So for a two week period, just in classification marking. And the nice thing about the report, as I said at the very beginning was, that it helps us identify gaps and it helps us identify administrative burdens. So if you're sitting there on a SIPR terminal and you're doing 30 to 50 emails a day, tick, 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 times four times a year, it became very administrative burden. So we sh we reduced that kind of tracking just in derivative down to once a year. And the folks that are selected to report, they report. And we found that uh, and at the installation level, they found that the best because they sit right with the wing commander. They know if they're reporting, they know when they're reporting and how much they're reporting. And if they're not getting the support, they can go straight into that installation commander who will help them get the support that they need from the, uh, the actors out in the field. So that's how we identify our sample size and that's just going straight over to the CIO A6 and finding out who's got a, who's got a token and those folks are then uh, identified through the matrix. They select the 20% off their matrix and then uh, that's how they collect their data. Uh, we have an automated tool, uh, the CMT, classification management tool. From a derivative uh, classification perspective, we're able to, uh, through uh, some programming, uh, collect the number of derivative decisions, uh, and that facilitates our ability to, to report. Yeah, so I think this, 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 you're answering more of how you your, your 311 data. 311 data. Gathering. Yeah, so th this question was more about those questions in the self-inspection report on percentage of personnel who, who, who get um, oh, different types of security sure. training, right. uh, you know, on the performance evaluations. How do you get that data? I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, no. I didn't uh, No, uh, sorry about that. Uh, we are able to, through a, a new program that we have, uh, uh, CARE, which is a uh, compliance reporting tool, we're able to, to determine from, from the ODNI, you know, who and who hasn't taken derivative classification training in real time, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, able to run reports off of that, so it's a little bit of leveraging technology. We've got a you know a, a snapshot in time of who is in compliance with regards to training at any given time. Uh, one of the other new features of this is as it comes time to, from a yearly perspective, as we get closer, warnings are sent out, and then ultimately, if it's not done, access to the system is turned off. So you can you can you can see from that if that's going to happen, you're going to get that compliance. So we're able to to obtain that data through through that tool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have a web-based tool, actually, that tracks who take the training initially and annually. And actually, when we send out annually, we have a deadline. And if we're not meeting that deadline with our numbers, we look to have 100% participation. We'll send out a threatening email that we're going to pull your clearance. <laughs> and all of a sudden, we get a boatload of certificates coming in. So <laughs> that's how we track them. Also, we actually look at performance evaluation during a self-inspection. Because we're small, we don't have that many sites, we actually look at all the performance evaluation for folks with clearances. One of the other things I would add, and it's, you know, hats off to the ODNI, within our PERS, within class, uh, derivative classification is a line item uh, from, a, from a PER perspective. So it is evaluated by supervisors, whether or not you've taken training and how you're going about doing that on your daily, uh, daily business. To add to that, OPM does derivative classification training once a year. We do it annually. We do. We don't well. do it every two years. Because of the deficiencies we found, we do it annually. So within the Air Force, we're tracking uh, the Center for Development of Security Excellence under Defense Security Service. They have a, a great, we, we have a couple requirements. If you're going on the CIPRNET for the first time, you have to take their marking training. It's about a three hour course and then you have to take the initial derivative classification training as well. So they know how to mark, they learn how to mark, and then they learn how to do derivative classification at the same time. 
And in the Air Force, we have a, a learning management system, and we work with the learning management system folks to get codes so that when they go online and they take these trainings, they submit them to their unit training manager, who then applies the code, and it goes straight into the learning management system. And then when our teams go out to do inspections, one of the items is derivative training. They go over to the uh, comm squadrons, who act as our CIOA6, find out everybody that's on the system. And it could be thousands in some places. So, and they take a percentage and they can look straight into the learning management system and see who has had their derivative and who has not and report it accordingly or make it happen. And normally they make it happen within 30 days if they find a deficiency. And I'll tell you that process there is so much better to where we, we were at because I believe a few years ago when I first, we went from 40% up to 91% mm. in, uh, in training. And also, because of the process, self-inspection process, we found some gaps on how we really had to measure who should be getting derivative classification because the Air Force, our security managers were trying to train everybody in the United States Air Force on derivative classification, uh, whether they were a gate guard, uh, janitorial, whoever, that may have access to classify, and it wasn't working. Uh, trying to, it, it was like trying to herd cats. Uh, they just couldn't get everybody in to do the training. So we went to a just-in-time type of training for access to classified from the, your initial access. But the initial time you start touching a classified system, you're into the training process for derivative, and that, that's helped a lot. At the NRC, we also track our training um, via web-based system. Our performance evaluations, uh, full disclosure, take a little bit more time for us to get to full compliance on. Um, we had to leverage our um, Office of Human Resources to help us. Um, our office doesn't get to see all the performance evaluation um, criteria. Um, we look at them during self-inspections, but even though we're small, we can't get access to every employee that requires it. So we've um, collaborated um, with our office of the Chief Human Capital Officer, uh, and they assist us with, when they put out the memorandum each fiscal year for the requirements and performing performance appraisals and evaluations, they now include our information in their communication. Um, so it's all centralized now through them, which has been helpful, but we're still hoping for more success. On our initial training too, uh, we just got word last week that on initial training, all our cleared and uncleared personnel get get some type of training on protecting classified mm -hmm. information. Uh, you've heard me talk about the IG system. I actually have two communicators. I have one where an organization isn't processing any classified and one where they do process and handle classified. And on this one checklist where they don't proce uh, process classified, on that one little communicator, it says, do your people know how to report uh, the finding of classified or sensitive information. And I give them a little, inside that product, I give them a little checklist, and I tell them to sample 20% of their organization, and they, they literally walk around and say, what would you do, and they take a cover sheet. What would you do if you found something that looked like this on the, in the bathroom? Because just because they're not cleared doesn't mean they don't have the opportunity to run into this, this information that's laying there, and we really need them to know how to report. We just got notified last week uh, for initial orientation training for all Air Force employees is going to be placed into the new employee orientation when they arrive to the Air Force. So uh, that's already documented, but it's kind of manually. Now we're going to actually be able to put some stuff in the learning management system. They'll be able to do some web-based training and, of course, uh, get a, a verbal small verbal portion from a security manager when they walk into the unit and it will be documented for the life of that employee in the Air Force. And then they're subject every year to be asked questions and tested if they really remember that from 20 years ago, how to report <laughs> uh, a security incident just because of the process that we're putting in place. Because I think reporting is a very good risk mitigator. If everybody in the organization knows how to report and knows who to report stuff to, that's, that's very important for us to get to a uh, resolution of an incident quickly. All right, well, thank you. This has been a great discussion. Um, 
So there were two more topics that, that, I, that we, I would like to have discussed today. Uh, one was best practices, although we've heard a lot in, in, in the discussions um, that we had. And the other was the future, and we heard a little bit about that. But And, and unfortunately, I think we, we, we were not able to get to them because I do want to open, open the floor up to questions for, from you. Um, so, um, you know, let's, let's turn to you. If you have any questions, um, I, I do ask that you, you use one of the microphones to, um, to, to ask. Um, so, any questions? Please, yeah. Now, Bruce Hampton, NSA. Um, this is a little uh, advanced to the next topic, but the CUI executive order also calls for a self-inspection program. Uh, in thinking about that, are you planning on rolling it into this same program or doing a dual program? And if that's the case, what are your thoughts on that? And I'm not sure I have the answer to that. Um, uh, I, I, maybe, maybe our director can speak to that. Since this is being taped, he said uh, this is a work in progress and they're going to hopefully get them moved back together again. I'll just repeat that in the mic here. So, any thoughts from the panel members? So I will tell you from the Air Force perspective, it'll be rolled in because our senior agency official for NSI is also the same senior agency official for CUI, also has control over our special access programs. So it, it's all going to be rolled into one while our inspectors are out looking they will definitely start putting a press on that as well. And they already do, to, a, to an extent, take a look at how folks in the, in, at the installations and then across the MAGCOMs in the Air Force handle uh, what we call for official use only, law enforcement sensitive information, those CU types that do. Uh, it's not extensive reporting on that, but they will bring it up at the, at the installation level and they will report in the IG as well because we still follow uh, in the Air Force the DOD manual 5200.01 volume four for our guidance and we still, there still have a requirement to protect that sensitive information. So it'll be rolled right into our process. At OPM, there's a struggle because the CIO handles our PII, but the, C, the classification program where the self-inspection is, is a good tool and a good program. It's a valuable program within OPM. So there's a tug of war of where it's going to go between CIO and the classification security program. So, And I would offer, uh, based on resources, we're just going to have to look for that synergy and leverage that to uh, uh, you know, have the, the, the same people who are, are reviewing the NSI also take a look at the, at the CUI as well. And basically, again, resources. Like OPM, the NRC has it in two different offices, so it'll be interesting how we end up implementing self-inspection. Uh, we have another question. Hello, my name is Anita Beeson. I'm from the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. Um, we were out in the overflow room, so we didn't get to answer your question uh, regarding NGA's CONGA, which is the Consolidated NGA Classification Guide. Um, it, that was a great undertaking, and, and it's going to be very beneficial for the agency. I do have a two-part question in terms of best practices. We've just uh, reestablished the InfoSec program at our agency, and um, the first year we were going through the motions of just reestablishing it and um, getting the senior buy-in from the agency. So now as the program manager for this uh, program, of course Manning is always everything, so we have four personnel for the entire agency to uh, stand up this program. So I wanted to get from you all um, what are your best practices and suggestions in terms of, one, regarding assessments, um, quarterly assessments that our agency does for the final reporting to ISU? What are your recommendations in terms of focus areas? How many or what areas should we particularly look into in terms of do we do two or three assessments per quarter or focus on one substantial assessment? Um, just wanted to find out your perspective on that. Secondly, because we are partially DOD and IC, 
it's always a challenge to merge the ICDs plus the DOD policy. And um, we're a very unique organization, so we find ourselves in kind of a, a quagmire with having to answer to two masters, ODNI as well as OUSDI. So what were your recommendations in terms of establishing a, a substantial InfoSec program given our dual hat um, role? Very good question. Um, I, I had the opportunity to speak to uh, Dr. Rosemary Helton just before during the networking, so I, I'm not gonna throw you too far under the bus, doctor, but I'm gonna put you in front of it. Um, so Stan, I wanna take the second question first because there's some very, very common threads when it comes to IC and collateral practices that today are a little bit disconnected. I'll, I'll give you an example. Portable electronic devices handle one way in the IC community, handed, handled a little bit different in the collateral, and maybe without probably too much data given away, maybe a little risky, okay? We've been talking, there's a panel, so the first thing I would tell you to do is reach out to USDI and get on the Defense Information Security Advisory Board so that you can bring your concerns to them because you're operating in two areas. That is a very important board, so they will get you involved with that. And you need to bring up those issues where you see the gaps, which is what we're all starting to do and uh, Dr. Helton, Kate Foster, all on the USDI, they realize it and they're working diligently to fill those gaps. So that could help marry the two programs together, okay? The first question was basically standing up a program, correct? Yes. I, I would ask first, do you have any policy? Yes, we do have a policy. That directs the self-inspection program? Correct. Okay, so that's the very first step and then from there, what are your resources besides you for? Um, we do have a security professional um, that is within the directorate, and we utilize them as well as our OPSEC officers as a coalition to help um, uh, analyze some of the weak points within the KG's missions as well as understanding some of the uh, strengths that we can utilize for the entirety of the security. Great, because it sounds like you're more almost into, into running mode uh, with your, your resources, then you, you're probably farther along than you, than you realize. The question was also quarterly versus four times a year. When you, when you mandate those times, I will tell you from a, a big mill depth, it's all about what burden are you putting on the organization. If I'm completing one inspection only to start another, I'm probably not gonna be as supportive of your program as if I gotta do it once a year. So you're gonna have to determine your ops tempo and what is that, and I, and I think Christine hit it right on the nail. She found a problem with derivatives so she made it every year, as to every two years. I would never get away with that in the Air Force. Just <laughs> would not get away with that. But you have to figure out that optimum ops tempo for doing your inspection process. <clears throat> Yeah, I would agree, and um, you know, one of the things that I heard is, is your staffing. Um, looking for ways to, to also leverage people that are, that are uh, embedded in some of these uh, programs. Um, if, you, if you can't increase your staff, looking for unique ways to, to, to get eyes and ears, if you will, where people can support. Maybe somebody is an analyst and understands derivative very well and having them as a, as a resource for people to, to use. Um, you know, again, again I, I believe me, I appreciate the, the limitations from a staffing perspective. So thinking of unique, I hate to say it, outside of the box, way, box ways 
<clears throat> of being able to use subject matter experts that may not be in the security directorate specifically, <clears throat> but have a certain expertise that you can leverage and go to. Understanding, of course, that's difficult as well because they have their, their day job as well. But uh, I think you would find, in, you know, overall, um, people are, are willing to help in cases like that. Uh, of course, you know, it sounds like you're starting this back up and you're examining this. I, I mentioned earlier your senior agency official, you know, their support, collecting data, trends, issues that you're seeing um, and put forward to them might help you obtain additional personnel. Not all the time, but sometimes, particularly if you can show trends and analysis and data Senior officials a lot of times like data, so if you can show them, hey, we've got an issue here, or we want, run the risk of this, you might find yourself being successful in, in possibly getting some more, uh, some more help. So those are two, two, two uh, strategies that you, you might want to take a look at. Um, I can also offer, I understand uh, the, the dual hat at nature, um, uh, but you, know, uh, you mentioned the, the DISAB. Uh, we also uh, have several working groups within the IC that can help differentiate some of those issues, uh, specifically the CMIWG, or Classification Management Impl Implementation Working Group. NGA does have representation there. Uh, be happy to talk to you offline about who that is, uh, as well as other working groups within the IC, um, again, to help uh, with regards to those, those different aspects. And believe me, I understand answering to the two different masters is sometimes difficult. Um, but uh, we're here as a resource to help with that. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Uh, we, we're, we're almost out of time. I'm not sure we have time for another question. Is it a very quick one, sir? Good morning. Uh, Jay Greenbaum, Federal Aviation Administration. We've discussed this in our uh, site visits from ISO, but I'm just curious for the panel, uh, what threshold or criteria do you have in terms of the requirement that derivative classifiers, the designation of classified information be in there? performance appraisals, at what point must it be in the appraisal? What, what is the extent of derivative classification? Is it anyone with a clearance? Uh, is it people who draft classified emails on a classified system? How often do uh, classifiers have to be performing those activities for the requirement to be in their performance appraisal? Now, let me speak to that first. So, so okay. uh, the, 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 the threshold that, that it, it, it informally said it's not in policy anywhere, but, but if, if a person has access to a classified system, then, then that person needs that derivative classification training. Um, e even if they don't actually do it on the system, um, the fact that they have access, they could, they could at any time, and they really need to, to be prepared to do that um, if, if that's the case. With um, regard. With regard to the performance appraisals, I know at the NRC all our employees are cleared, but they do not all have it in their performance appraisals. They are not all have derivative classifiers or access to classified IT systems. So the way we differentiate it is anyone who's a derivative classifier has to have it, original classifier, anyone who accesses classified on a routine basis, and we describe that as at least monthly. It's, it's fairly simple for us within the IC. Everyone who comes on board does, in fact, have access to a classified system. So to Bob's point, everybody has, mm -hmm. takes the training and has derivative classification uh, ability. Uh, and because of that, it's in everyone's uh, evaluation. It, and is that implemented in part by HR? Uh, is that done in coordination with HR? Uh, yes. OK. The same at OPM, coordination with HR. We have designated derivative classifiers. So it's put within their performance eval. For the Air Force, we're about at 41%. And I'll tell you, problematic, I'll tell, yeah. Uh, yeah, and it's problematic, right? And the reason is, is because of readiness. The HR community, when it comes to the military personnel, and when you start talking to the chiefs of staff, they're going to be looking at a whole different set of, of uh, evaluation criteria, such as can you run, jump, hopscotch, whatever they got to do for physical training. Uh, these days, and then a whole bunch of other performance evaluation standards. So our HR community has not gotten all the way to the point of mandating in everybody's. Our secur security community, I can almost guarantee you every one of us in the security are evaluated on some aspect of that uh, in their performance report, and probably more than one way and in one area. So that's where we're at in the Air Force on that. So we, so haven't much. we haven't reached that threshold. All right, well, uh, 
Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your question. Thank, thank all of you for your questions. Uh, we, we, we're out of time. Um, I, I want to again thank our panelists, uh, Krista, Greg, Christine, and Randy. Uh, great discussions today. I, I, I think we can all agree that there have been a lot of good ideas uh, uh, back and forth between this group, and, and I'm very pleased uh, to, to have had you here. Um, uh, you know, we, we saw some very different ways to implement a self-inspection program, but they, they were, these were all good programs. Um, and, you know, it's appropriate they're different because the agencies are, are very different. Um, and we also wa saw why these programs are good programs. Uh, you know, they're, they're good because there are sound policies and, 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 and practices. They're good because there are people in the agencies that care about them. You know, people like you and, and um, the senior agency official. Um, and they're good because you guys understand what self-inspections are all about. You know, you, 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 you're looking for things that, that need attention and you take actions to correct them. Um, so, um, you know, self-evaluation and, and correction, that's what this is all about. Um, and, you know, I, I thank them for, 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 for helping us today. I thank all of you for coming. And, and for you know all you do for the classified program because again without without you uh, none of this works. Um, so so thank you. So I need to get your car around because Air Force has it going on. Okay, uh, before we get into our final thrilling panel, why don't we take a couple minutes to stretch in place as much in place as possible, please? Okay. Okay. Before too many of you escape, we'll jump right back into this. Um, our final presentation, if that encourages more people to stay, is the Controlled Unclassified Information, or CUI, program briefing from Mark Riddle. Uh, Mark is a senior program analyst here at ISU. He co-authored the National Institute for Standards and Technology, or NIST, special publication 800-171, which is entitled, Protecting Controlled Unclassified Information in Non-Federal Systems and Organizations. We are awesome at naming stuff in the government. Uh, dated June of 2015. He currently serves as lead for implementation and oversight within the CUI program and is responsible for monitoring and evaluating agency efforts related to CUI implementation, so you'll all be seeing him soon. Ladies and gentlemen, Mark Riddle. Woohoo! All right, everybody, thank you very much for coming out. Uh, I'm going to talk to you today about CUI, and I'm hoping, I really do hope, that this is not the first time that you've heard the term or that you know any, the first time that you're hearing anything about the program. A lot of you, have, I'm sure, who've been to previous events or been out and about have seen me or some of my colleagues address the CUI program. For some of you who are new, a uh, quick overview about what CUI is. CUI is information that we protect. It's information that we protect because there's a law, a regulation, or a government-wide policy that says it needs to be protected. This is an information security reform. This means that we're already protecting sensitive information right now. So we just need to bring everybody back on the rails. Actually, when you think about the CUI program, we are establishing those rails so that way we know when we're off track and where we need to be. So what we're going to be covering today is a little bit about what this reform includes, some of the key elements of this program, basically what we protect and how we protect that information. We're going to talk about some of our future initiatives, like the Federal Acquisition Regulation, and then we're going to get right down to it phased implementation and what you need to do or what your agencies are currently doing to implement this program. Uh, of course, the briefing will be made available online. Um, also, if you have any questions or if you need um, some additional briefings on the CUI program, please feel free to reach out to me or the CUI staff. Uh, you can just put in a search engine, Mark Riddle at NARA, or my email address is mark.riddle at nara.gov. I'm happy to email with you. Uh, email, converse, have meetings. Actually, a couple of you have already taken me up on that. We have meetings actually set for tomorrow to talk about implementation and what it takes. So without any um, further delay, we're just going to dive right into it. So the CUI program is an information security reform, and we love graphics, right? We want to have a graphical representation of what it looks like right now and what we're trying to get to. So what you see here on this graphic is, of course, what it looks like right now when we're thinking about protecting information. It's kind of a mess. You have over 150 different designations for sensitive information, and probably even more than that when it comes to information security programs on what it means to actually protect that information. When you think about the CUI program, keep in mind 
it is based off of existing agency practices, meaning that you're already protecting this information, but you're not doing it consistently across the board. When we think about the CUI program, we have to recognize that there are some agencies and organizations that actually do it really well. They're not the issue. It's everybody else. Of course, when you think about information security, what happens if you have one agency or one entity out there that is safeguarding it in a very particular way, and then you have another agency or an entity that is not? They're protecting it just the bare, bare minimum. What does that do to information sharing? Information sharing oftentimes is severely impeded or it just doesn't happen because nobody has a nice warm fuzzy on what it means to protect and share this information or to, to share this information. If you're not protecting it the way that I'm protecting it, how do I know that when I send it to you, I'm not just going to expose it and potentially compromise that information? So when we think about the CUI program, it really comes down to four key points. Of course, we're going to clarify and limit what to protect. What this really means when you think about the CUI program is that it's house cleaning, meaning that right now the government, the executive branch, is overprotecting sensitive information or just overprotecting information. We have these overarching terms like FOUO, SBU, SSI, OUO, all these overarching terms that just say protect almost everything, and there isn't really clarity on what to protect. So with the CUI program, we're going to narrow the focus down. We're going to narrow it down to only those information types that need to be protected in accordance with the law, a regulation, or a government-wide policy. This is familiar to a lot of you because this is kind of what you're doing right now. But there are a couple of entities out there that have kind of taken the inch that they were given and kind of ran with it. They took a mile. So they started just touching information types and saying, you know what, we're going to start protecting this. We're going to call it FOUO or Pat's, Pat's information. You never know, right? So we needed to bring everybody back to reality and say, you know what, we just need to protect this information, stuff that we can actually link to laws and regulations. So we're going to talk a little bit about what that clarification is going to look like um, in the form of the CUI registry. The next element of this reform is defining safeguarding. Now, when I said earlier that we start out with laws and regulations and government-wide policies, this is how it has been working inside of the executive branch since its formation. The first time some guy reached across, you know, probably across a horse and said, here, take this information to that place over there, take it to that city, and protect it on its way, that's when the problem started, because this guy who handed him that document or that information didn't say how. So when you think about laws and regulations and government-wide policies, they did a great job of telling us what to protect, but they did a bad job of saying how, and they left it in the hands of agencies to define the how. So this is where the FOUOs, the SBUs, and all the protective regimes and, and kingdoms, the silos of excellence, if you will, kind of came out of. This authority, this implied authority that was given to agencies when it came to protecting sensitive information. So the CUI program takes safeguarding and the definition of it out of the hands of agencies and codifies it into a federal regulation. Talk a little bit about how we got those standards in just a moment. Now, all of this, of course, is in the, in the hopes that this information will be shared appropriately. We want those blockages that are up there to stop. We don't want agencies to say to another, I will only share this with you if you're doing it my way. No, they need to be doing it to a standard. They are going to share it as long as there is a floor that that entity is meeting. And there's an oversight entity or a mechanism within that agency and external to that agency to ensure that they're staying on the rails. Now, when we talk about the last bullet, reinforcing existing laws and regulations and government-wide policies, the CUI program is based off of this, authorities, laws and regulations, right? Now, laws and regulations in the government are not necessarily created equal. You have to know that about the CUI program. We have laws and regulations that tell us what to protect and fail to say how, and then we have other types of information out there or to other types of authorities that tell us what to protect and then they tell us something else. They say, only share this with these folks or don't share this with these folks or protect it this way or mark it this way. Real quick show of hands, who filed their taxes or who didn't, right? No, no, no takers? Oh, I got one, right? So anyway. Tax information is a type of CUI that is specified in nature. And what that means is that the laws and regulations surrounding that type of information are very specific about how that information should be marked, how it should be protected in the physical environment and in the electronic environment, all the way down to how to destroy it. They did a good job, right? 
Other laws and regulations did not do that. They just said, here, protect this information. That's it. So when we think about the CUI program, we want to make sure that laws and regulations are actually followed. So there's never been an entity out there before or an, a program to ensure that for all types of information that requires protection. So that's what we're doing. We're filling in the gaps when laws and regulations are silent on what it means to protect that information. And we're emphasizing, we're putting a magnifying glass over those laws and regulations and the prescriptive nature. So that way, the lawmakers or the regulation makers, what they wanted will actually be carried out. Because they didn't just do it for because they thought it was a good idea. There was a reason behind that prescriptive nature that they put into those laws and regulations. Now, before we get too deep into uh, the briefing here, we got to think about why the government does anything to begin with, right? We didn't just come up with the idea of the CUI program because we wanted to, you know, make a lot of people retire and leave the government because of the thought of implementation. No, you know, we actually implement or the CUI program was born out of necessity. If you look at what information security has been looking like inside of the executive branch and even in non-federal entities, it doesn't look too good. You know, nobody right now, if I said, do you think the executive branch, do you think that the United States handles sensitive information appropriately? Do you think that we can do a better job? Nobody's going to say, you know, I think it's perfect right now. We have the OPM data breach. We have Equifax. We have all things going on right now that are saying that we got to do a better job collectively. The CUI program is what we're doing about it inside of the executive branch, and by extension, everybody who's doing business with us. So the CUI program, it comes down to two things. What are we going to protect, and how are we going to protect that information? A couple of you who've been into this, into these briefings have know this. You've heard the term CUI registry a bunch. This is what we protect under the CUI program. This is a catalog of those categories of information or information types, all of which can be linked to a law, regulation, and government-wide policy. This regulate or this guidance document, the CUI registry, is the first of its kind. It's the first time that something has been put out there to say, yeah, let's protect this, and this is why, and let's establish a program around protecting this type of information. This has been out there since 2011. It's been out there to assist agencies and other stakeholders to get a handle on implementation. One of the panelists earlier talked about policy and how it takes time. The CUI program is no different. Uh, some of you who've been keeping track and you always like to push it back on us said, why the heck has it taken so long? You guys put a man on the moon in, sh in quicker time than you did to create the CUI program. It's been about six, seven years, right? Sometimes a little longer. You know, Pat used to have black hair back in the day. Now, look at him. Look what's left. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> so it, it's taken some time. Because when you think about it, information security reform of this magnitude has never been undertaken. You know, clarifying what we're going to protect and how we're going to protect it wasn't a tall order. So what we did in forming this program is, of course, we asked stakeholders and agencies two basic questions. What are you protecting and why? And how are you protecting that information? And the answer to both of those questions formed the CUI program. This is why when you look at the CUI registry, you're going to see or types of information that you're already protecting. There may be some eye-openers. You're like, wow, I didn't know we were protecting that. When you think about the CUI registry and the 24 categories that exist, not every one of you or not every agency is going to handle and work with these information types. It just doesn't work like that. So you can imagine the information types handled by the Federal Aviation Administration differ greatly from those of the Department of Justice or ODNI or the Department of Defense or all the way down to component elements of those agencies. So you can imagine when we talk later on about policies and what they should include, the short version is they should include specific references and guidance regarding the information types that your folks are actually working with, not the entire catalog of the CY registry. Now, the registry, of course, you have the website right there, is a glorified website. It is a website, actually, right? It shows you these categories of information and the subcategories and the underlying laws and regulations. It also provides hyperlinks to various training modules that we've developed to help agencies get an understanding of the CY program. Over the summer, we released nine training videos. These videos are optional for agencies to use. You don't have to use them. You could develop your own, or you could take what we've developed and help your programs a little bit. Now, a little bit about the CUI registry, and this is one of these common misconceptions. We do not expect and never have expected employees, the workforce, to go visit the CUI registry. 
to learn how to protect CUI. Because what you're going to find there is a, a link that says, here's this information, privacy information, a description, and then the underlying laws and regulations, and whether or not those laws and regulations are specified in nature. What the registry is for is for those policy writers within agencies, the folks who are going to be writing policy and procedure about CUI. It's a tool for you to extract that information and write policy. Part of what we do when we write policy and procedures is we're translating. We're translating information from a law and regulation into something that people can use to ensure that this information is adequately protected. These mics are all up in my business right here. I keep hitting them. So keep that in mind when you look at the CUI registry. We don't want everybody to go visit it. It's for you, the folks who are actually working on implementing the program. It has training resources that you can download, um, but you don't want to link directly to like YouTube or our website. What folks are doing, what agencies are doing in regard to training and awareness is that they are downloading these videos and running them off of their learning platforms and then making them required viewing. That's how you get it done. That's how you track compliance to training. Anyway, this is a website. Take a look at it. It is the what we protect inside of the CY program. The next is how we protect this information. Earlier, I spoke to regulations and how we formed the CY program. We asked you, what are you currently doing to protect this information? And everybody submitted to us their best practices, everything that they have in policy to define protection. We took these, the input from agencies and stakeholders and formed this. It took us a while. A while. You know, I think it was six, seven years of interagency, formal comment, informal comment, debate over everything from the color of the cover sheet to whether or not we should require email encryption or sending emails to only .gov or .mail addresses. Everything was debated over the years, and it took a long time to get this regulation out there. But what you see here and why it's going to be familiar to you is because it's part of your programs already. Right now, what you have there is based off of what you currently do to protect information. Now we've just established the rails. So when you think about implementation, you just have to find out where you are and where you need to be. And you may be in some of these areas already. Now, this is a total information security program, meaning that we're going to take security down to its entire life cycle, from information's designation, how it becomes CUI to begin with, to how that information is shared and protected in the physical and in the electronic environments, all the way down to how we destroy it or decontrol it. Decontrol is what we call declassify, right? That's when something ceases to be CUI. So these are all terms that we're going to be uh, addressing, not today, but as you implement the program, you're going to hear these things more and more. Of course, this regulation became effective on November 14th of 2016. And what did that mean to the executive branch? It meant that it was time to start taking the CUI program seriously. It meant that it was time to start designating officials for this, assessing what you're currently doing and finding the deltas between implementation or between what's currently being done and what's going to be asked of you. So over the past year, you can imagine that a lot of agencies have been conducting data calls. They've been forming groups to focus on what it takes to implement the program. And some of them actually started putting pen to paper. They started drafting policies and procedures to start adapting the CUI program um, into their agencies. Now, the Federal Acquisition Regulation. This is something that we're working on right now that's going to standardize the way in which agencies give guidance, safeguarding guidance, to non-federals. It's going to standardize it. Right now, agencies have contracts and agreements with a multitude of stakeholders, whether they be industry, state, local folks, and a lot of those agreements take the form of this. They will say, you know what, you're going to do business with us. I want you to call it what I call it. I want you to protect it the way that I protect it. And then that's how they rock and roll, right? But I'll tell you, when it comes to consistency, this is where a lot of inconsistent practices are conveyed. Because if every agency is defining protection differently, and they're entering into agreements with a multitude of stakeholders and pushing that out the door, you can have an industry member, a contractor, who actually has five different ways of handling the exact same information and is subject to five different oversight models from those entities. So they don't know which way to go. So by establishing a single standard for protecting CUI, we're going to have consistency and hopefully we can focus where we need to focus, make a risk-based decision about who we actually conduct oversight to in when we entrust it to non-federal entities. 
So the bottom line here is that sometime at the end, the tail end of fiscal year 18, this will be out and it will prompt agencies to modify their acquisitions and their agreements. Also, ISOO is working on an implementation notice, CUI notice 2017, I believe 03, that speaks to agreements because the federal acquisition regulation doesn't necessarily apply to all agreements. But we're going to give agencies guidance on what those agreements should include, things like the identification of categories and the specific nature of protection when it comes to those categories of information. This will also be out sometime um, in probably the next couple of months. The FAR, because it has to go through a public rulemaking process, will probably take about a year. But keep an eye out for CUI Notice 2017-03 because that will kind of give you a heads up on what's going to go into the FAR and it will be the basis for what you can start your implementation activities on when it comes to agreements and contracts. Now phased implementation, I have two bottles of water up here, I'm not sure which one's mine. <laughs> That's awkward, that's probably not mine. <laughs> but anyway, um, phased implementation, so the CUI program is going to be implemented in phases. This means that we didn't just pick a day in the future to say, you know, June 25th of 2020, that's the day the entire executive branch turns the lights on for the CUI program. It doesn't work like that. It can never work like that. The reason why is my second bullet, resources. The implementation of the CUI program is going to require some funds. We can do a lot leveraging existing agency resources, but there's going to be a time when this government is going to have to pull out their checkbook and start writing a check to agencies to ensure that this program gets off the ground and it's implemented and sustained the way that it should be. Now, when you think about the implementation of the CUI program and what it means in the long term, in three to four years, this is what we project based off of what agencies are reporting right now for the implementation of policy, training, transition of systems, and the modifications of agreements. In three to four years, it's going to look a lot different out there. FOU is something that we're going to talk about at new higher orientations or maybe at the National Archives to describe what we used to do that was so bad. So throughout the implementation of the program, because it's going to occur in phases, and what that means is that it's going to occur in phases throughout the executive branch and even within agencies. So some agencies will be able to implement the program ahead of others because of the resources that they receive, and others are going to go a little bit slower. ISU is going to track how much money that agencies receive and hopefully tie the resources that agencies receive to the pace of implementation. So throughout the next three to four years, you have to expect that CUI markings and practices, depending on when an agency implements, will start to take hold. Some agencies will implement and others will still be calling things FOUO. They're going to exist at the same time. But as we get closer to that three to four year mark, it will eventually be phased out completely. Now, ISU's job is to monitor agency actions to implement and eventually go out and conduct oversight of those agency programs. But right now, it's about monitoring actions to implement. So right now, November 1st, agencies are required to report to us the status of their efforts. And we're going to talk about that in just a moment. Uh, but this is going to be an annual requirement. It's going to morph as the years go on because right now, it's about where are you at in implementation. And then later on, it's going to be what does your program look like? It's going to be a little bit uh, familiar to you. It's going to be kind of similar to the way that we monitor self-inspection activities of agencies for the classified program. Now, when we talk about sequencing, phased implementation occurs throughout agencies at different paces according to the resources that they receive, but phased implementation also applies within an agency. There are some things that need to come before others, right? We're going to talk about that, but of course policy is the, the cornerstone of most agency CUI programs. Without a policy, you probably aren't going to have a training. You aren't going to have a basis to modify systems or to even establish a self-inspection program, so it's key. We're going to talk about that. So the annual report, really quick. I don't know how many of you are going to be charged with this. A lot of agencies, actually the ones in the room, have already submitted their annual report to us. Now, first, who is required to report to ISU? when it comes to the implementation of their CUI programs. It is parent agencies. So we're not looking for reports from the Department of the Air Force or ATF or the, even the FAA. The Department of Transportation, the Department of Defense, the Department of Justice, they have responsibilities for ensuring that their components also implement. Now they can stem out or, or farm out the data call to their components, but we have no expectation or requirement for those components to report their implementation efforts directly to us. Now, 
If you are a parent agency, what do you have to report? It kind of sums up right here. Where are you right now? Do you have a draft? Is something in internal coordination? Are you testing something? Is it completed? Or, more importantly, when do you expect to be there? So if you don't have a finalized policy, we want to project the date. When do you expect that policy to be finalized and on the street? Because that's how implementation really starts within an agency. So right now, based off of the reports that we received over the summer and based off of the early annual report submissions, most major agencies in the executive branch will have a finalized policy either in January or February of 2018 or possibly the summer and fall of next year. So it's going to get real really quick because once that policy hits the street, you're going to see training from an agency to the workforce on what CUI is at that agency and how to protect it. So just know that this is out there right now. Um, over the next couple of months, of course, we're going to be analyzing the data and ev eventually reporting it up to the Office of the President. Now, one of the main questions that we ask agencies, the first question, actually, beyond all the administrative nonsense or good stuff, not nonsense, um, is have you budgeted for the CUI program? That's a big question because we know that most implementation activities are going to be resource dependent. And then we ask questions. How much did you ask for and how much did you receive? And now in the security game, we know that those figures kind of look like this. I asked for $5 million, I got 200000 or sometimes even less. So when you're looking to implement a program, the delta between those figures kind of speaks to how well it's going at that agency. We can do so much. We can only do so much with the resources that we have. Eventually, we do need additional full-time employees. We need resources to buy new destruction equipment or to even assess computer systems or even physical safeguardings. So now we're going to get into the recommendations related to the program. Now, this is all solidified or actually documented in CUI Notice 2017-01. Everybody wants to know, where do, where do I start? What does it take to implement the CUI program? So we issued a notice that kind of describes not only um, what to do, but kind of a course of action, kind of what we've seen other agencies do um, as far as best practices goes when it comes to implementation. So this is what we're going to cover in the back half, but definitely go to the CUI registry under the policy and guidance section and download this thing. Because if you want to know what it takes to implement the program or where to start, that's going to give you some guidance. And of course, it is not our uh, final issuance of guidance. It's just one of our first. So as you, uh, you can imagine, over the next couple of months, we're going to be issuing additional um, guidance documents, not based off of need or not because somebody's pushing on us, because we know what it takes to implement this program. You know, you're going to want to know the specifics of what a self-inspection program actually include. You know, right now, if you looked at the 32 CFR 2002, our implementing reg, it says develop a self-inspection program. And you have a lot of flexibility on what that is. But agencies, you need guidance on what a self-inspection program should include, a lot of like what we're talking about up here on this panel. So ISU is right now we're working on a notice that speaks to what they can include, recommendations for an agency self-inspection program, what the focus should be, the activities, the personnel, and even the structure of those organizations, because there are a sub-organization within an agency. So we're going to dive right in. Program management. This is what we mean when we talk about leadership. You need leadership and some sort of a management structure for the CUI program. It is not going to succeed unless you point to somebody and say, you, you're my guy. Make this happen. Or as Captain Picard would say, make it so. Any Star Trek fans? No. Nobody. Nobody. <laughs> Been off the air too long. Dated myself. So what we've asked agencies to do is designate a senior agency official and a program manager to oversee and manage the implementation of the program. You kind of have some familiarity with what a senior agency official does for the classified program. It's very likely that that could be the same guy wearing this hat too, but maybe not. It just depends. But we want the agency head to reach out and touch some senior official within the agency and say, yo, not yo, but you, you make this happen, right? You could say yo, I like Rocky too, right? So the senior agency official and the program manager, this could bring you two people to run a program or to implement a program. That is not enough. What you need is you need to rally the troops. You need to rally all the major stakeholders or internal components of an agency to start to think about implementation. So what you're seeing is that agencies are forming these CUI working groups, implementation 
working groups focused on what it takes to implement this program. And they have representation from every major stakeholder within the agency. If you took an org chart for any agency or organization and you said, I need a guy from every one of these elements at the table when it comes to implementing this program, because every one of them probably has policies, training, or unique information types for their world that need to be included in this program. Policy. We've issued significant, or not significant, but we've issued a lot of guidance to agencies on what policy should look like or what it should include. Now, when you think about policy, you have to realize that it's probably more than one policy, not just for an agency, but also components. Think about why we need more than one policy. Every agency or component sometimes handles different information types. So it could warrant a special policy just for that group. That's why. Also, think about how far reaching CUI is compared to the C uh, CNSI program. If you were to take the average agency, I'll bet you that the CNSI program, maybe you have cleared folks, 15 to 20% of the workforce handles and works with classified information or possibility of e or has the possibility of even being exposed to it. In the CUI program, it's 100%. Everybody in that agency from the top down has the possibility of handling and working with some type of CUI. So you got to think about that. It's an all hands type training. It isn't just a specific type of the workforce. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about training next, but in CUI Notice 2017-01, there are specific elements that need to be addressed in training. Uh, some of those elements are on the slide here. In regard to training, because of the nature of implementation, and it will be implemented in phases, it isn't all happening at once. So we have agencies who already have finalized policies. They are marking information as being CUI. OMB has issued guidance, federal guidance, to agencies to submit certain reports to them and mark it as being CUI. So it's going to be out there all over the place. So when you think about training, it has to take four flavors or four types of training you can envision. The first one is awareness training. You have to set the expectation that this change is actually happening. A lot of folks were taking the stance, I'll believe it when I see it. It was kind of an elusive figure, like, you know, like winter is coming. You guys get that? You know, but it's actually here right now. It happened on November 14th of 2016. That's a Game of Thrones reference, Pat. All right. He, he didn't know what I was talking about. <laughs> no. So anyway, so awareness training. And awareness training, it doesn't have to be a CBT. It doesn't have to be some kind of whiz-bang thing that you're running off of your learning platform. This could be some kind of a newsletter. It could take whatever form you need it to be for your agency. It, you just need to tell them that it's coming and give them some of the basics about this program. This is what the marking looks like. This is what we do if we receive this information. Oh, this is our projected time frame for implementation. Let the folks know when you guys are actually going to be implementing. The next type of training is orientation training. Once you have a policy in place, then you have to start training to that policy. FOUO is going to start to go away, and you need to train folks to what that's going to look like. So this is where you can go to the CUI registry, our training portal, and download and use some of our materials to help you on the way. Because if you don't have the resources, that's exactly why we developed these courses to begin with, to help agencies who are in a crunch right now. Eventually, you're going to get whiz-bang, and you're going to start making these courses on your own. And maybe we'll start using some of your stuff. But until we get there, Use our stuff as much as you can to raise awareness about this program. Um, we set up our training that you can use in modular form, meaning that if you don't want to train your folks on lawful government purpose and you think an information sheet gets it done, but you want to teach them heavily on marking or even what a controlled environment is for protecting and safeguarding this information, just use those courses or use the transcripts and the course materials for it. It's all there. And again, with the training that we've developed, it's not our last attempt at this. We already are in the works of developing additional training modules to assist and help agencies with their implementation efforts. The third type of training is CUI specified training. Now, this isn't just one overarching training within an agency. This is training that deals with a specific type of information that a very particular type of or a very particular section of the workforce is handling and working with. So you think about federal tax information, law enforcement information, unclassified nuclear information, or protected controlled infrastructure information. These are all examples of specified types of CUI that require or are very likely to have their own types of training associated with them. When you think about specified training and the CUI program, 
keep in mind, you're probably already training the workforce on this information. The CUI program isn't anything new. We just want to make sure that what's in those laws and regulations is actually trained to. So I guarantee you that if you go to DHS, they have an SSI training. They have a PCII training that deals with those unique information types. The IRS and the FBI have specific training that deals with federal tax information. Everybody in the room takes privacy training. All of these trainings are specified types of trainings that are required per those regulations. As part of your implementation and the training of the CUI program, you need to ensure that the folks who need to be trained in those specified categories are. The next, of course, is refresher. It isn't enough to just train people when they start working for our agency and start handling that information. Every once in a while, we need to refresh them on those concepts and safeguarding um, measures. The CUI program, the regulation says do it every, at least every two years. Most agencies are leaning towards an annual training requirement. They're actually leveraging what they're already using to train their workforce on information security and modifying it for the implementation of the program. It's already being pushed out annually. They're modifying those courses rather than injecting a brand new one into the workforce. Now, physical safeguarding. Think about the purpose of physical safeguarding when it comes to implementation. It really comes down to two things. We want to make sure that unauthorized individuals don't get access, and we also want to ensure that the correct people do, right? That's two parts of security, preventing access and allowing access where it's appropriate. Now, most agencies right now from a physical security standpoint are protecting CUI or sensitive information, meaning that I couldn't just walk up to the front door of any agency or organization without a badge or identification and just start nosing around files and walking up to computer systems. Somebody is going to challenge me, not just because I look suspicious, but because there's policies and procedures in place to prevent that type of access. So agencies, you can leverage existing physical security practices when you think about implementing the CUI program. They just need to be adapted a little bit. When you think about the CUI program from a physical standpoint, it isn't just about putting a barrier or a lock on the front door of an agency. It's also about assessing who is in this particular room. If you have a cubicle farm, who is in there? What types of information are they working on? Do they all need access to that information? Probably not. I use this example a lot about human resources departments within agencies are typically located on their own floors or their own suites. They typically operate off of their own unique network drives. We do this for a reason. We compartmentalize that section of the workforce and we don't integrate them with the general workforce because nobody has a lawful government purpose for access to that information. Only a select few do. We want that model to be extended to all parts of the agency. Do the assessment. You probably already are potting people right now based on what they're working on. But think about it isn't just the physical paper or the electronic means. It's about discussions also. We have sensitive discussions. And sometimes certain people in the room are not authorized to hear that information. This is why supervisory personnel have doors. It isn't because they are better than us. They get paid a little bit more, right? But it's because. They're having conversations. They're storing files that involve privacy information. We don't have a lawful government purpose for access to that information, so we put up a barrier. So as part of the implementation from a physical standpoint, assess what you're doing. Find out whether or not you're taking it all the way down into the workforce level. It isn't just about the outside door of your agency or your organization. From a system standpoint, if you've got a lot of IT folks in the room or from people from your chief information security office, the magic words here are the moderate confidentiality impact value. When we talked about laws and regulations and government-wide policies as being the basis for CUI and that our regulation, the implementing reg for the CUI program, fills the void on what it means to protect it when those laws and regulations are silent, the, out of 95% of the time, the place where the CUI program will fill that void is in the electronic environment because laws and regulations did not contemplate how information would be protected and shared in this environment that we have today. So the 32 CFR 2002 establishes that standard. They say, we say to agencies, if CUI is on a system, it has to be configured at least to this level. And for the uh, chief information guys in the room, security guys, the moderate confidentiality impact value equates to a laundry list of security controls that we place on systems to protect them. 
Right now, the good news is that if you were to conduct an assessment of what you're currently doing to protect information in the electronic environment, you'd probably find about 70 to 75 percent are already at the moderate level. But part of implementation is to assess. You have to do an inventory. How many systems do you have? Do they have CUI on them? Where are they currently configured? And then start planning for the implementation, the modification of those systems to that standard. Destruction. Now, CUI, at the end of its life cycle, needs to be destroyed in a very particular way. Now, we have some power words. They're not up on the slide here, but they are. We want the end of that process, the destruction process, to render that information unreadable, indecipherable, and irrecoverable. That means that if it was a piece of paper, you would not be able to make out a letter or a number. If you were using forensic software to assess a computer system to see if you could pull something off, you wouldn't be able to get anything. So look to the NIST Special Publication 888 as a guideline for how to satisfy this standard. From an implementation standpoint, you've got to get out there and start shaking some trees, asking the question, what are we doing now? Do we have policies in place? I'll tell you right now, from a, in the unclassified environment, agencies have kind of gone a little nuts when it comes to buying destruction equipment. Agencies right now can just go to Office Max or Office Depot or GSA and just buy any shredder, thinking that a shredder is a shredder is a shredder. No. When you think about CUI destruction or single step destruction of CUI, you need to buy a shredder that's cross cut. It needs to produce particles that are one millimeter by five. That sounds familiar because that's what we use in the classified world. When you're thinking about your social security number, your PII, your student records, your tax information, would you want any less? So look to this guidance. Now, it isn't just about paper. Keep in mind also that a lot of agencies, they like to give back to the communities. So they have policies and procedures in place right now, or maybe they don't have policies and procedures, where once we're going to get rid of this computer system, we're going to donate it to a local school. Or if you're overseas, they're going to donate it to a, an international organization. What are the policies and procedures surrounding the sanitization of that equipment before they hand it over? We're not saying you can't do that. We're just saying you've got to apply a little bit of security before you give away that hard drive. We want to make sure it's satisfied to a satisfactory level before it walks out the door. There needs to be policy and procedure to ensure consistency of that practice. Now, self-inspections. This kind of came up earlier on the panel. The CUI program has a requirement for a self-inspection program. This self-inspection program within agencies is going to look pretty similar to the classified program because we're talking about protecting information. So a lot of agencies right now are looking to leverage existing agency practices where they can. I think I heard a gentleman from the um, Department of the Air Force speak to, they kind of do that already, right? So they already have a practice to go out there and assess sensitive information and how it's protected. Now they have a standard to go out and evaluate against. So agencies right now are looking to see who's already going out there and assessing these areas for us, assessing training, assessing compliance. Now they know they have criteria to evaluate against. In a lot of cases, agencies wouldn't need to hire full-time employees. At some major agencies inside of the executive branch, they have folks who are already tasked with this job, but they've been doing it based on their, their gut instincts on what it means to protect this information. Now those security folks, they have a policy. They have a federal regulation to support those practices when it comes to implementing and overseeing that implementation. But there is a clear expectation that you develop one of these for the implementation of the CUI program. ISOO will be issuing guidance to agencies on the uh, recommended structure. You can still leverage what you got. You can use your classified program if you want. You can use your um, OIGs, or sometimes you have an internal audit team. Let them go crazy. Just let them adapt their programs. You don't necessarily need to hire new folks. We had Tom Hanks at the National Archives a couple weeks ago, right? He was right here up on the stage. Forrest Gump, right? So I can end with, that's about all I have to say about that. Um, does anybody have questions? I think um, we have about 10 minutes, and then I've got to turn it back over to our director. Um, but I'm happy to um, engage you with any questions. You can feel free to email me. We have a blog right now. So if you want to subscribe to the blog, you need the address, uh, shoot me an email. I'll shoot it back to you. Subscribe. That's how we're going to push information out. Updates on the registry, new training modules that we develop. That's, that's how we're going to communicate. When uh, you think about our liaison program for the CUI program, um, we can't be everywhere. 
We can't go out and do a lot of visits with agencies and stakeholders. We can push that information out using the media that we have. So the blog is wonderful. Subscribe. We're going to send it out to you. Also, PIDIB has got a blog. Also a good way to get information about that. So before I, I turn it back over to our director, does anybody have any questions? You don't need to go to the mic. Just shout it out, and I'll shout it back out, and then we can answer the question. Real quick, any hands? I see a guy's hand up. Okay, that's 500 right there. 500, 500, 500. No. <laughs> All right. Anybody? No. Uh, yes, sir? Where do you see this actually getting out to the non-federal people being required to follow this? Uh, so the question is, when do you expect to see this getting out to non-federal entities? It could actually be pretty quick. So right now, there's a couple of things that are out there for agencies to start using. One of them is the NIST Special Publication 800-171, Protecting CUI and Non-Federal Systems and Organizations. The CUI regulation is out there. It requires agencies to modify contracts and agreements. So as the agency implements, you can see that going out the door. Or in advance of the agency implementing, if they have a need to protect sensitive information which is being housed or used on a um, a non-federal system, they can push out some of the CUI requirements like the 171 through those agreements. So it's already out there right now. Back in 2015, DOD made reference to a key element of the CUI program in their DFARS, their Defense Federal Acquisition Regulation. It was the NIST SB 800-171, so they pushed it out on all contracts. That was part of the CUI program. It was not an implementation of the CUI program within DOD, it was them pushing out a requirement or a standards document to try to protect that information. You know, we don't do anything in the government unless we need to, right? So that regulation was originally issued in June of 2015 in direct response to incidents that were occurring in 13 and 14, incidents that were attributed to safeguarding guidance insufficient or non-existent from executive branch agencies to non-federal entities on how to protect that information, and it was getting us in trouble, right? We were having incidents, so we needed to do something about it. So the, the regulation, the NIST SP 800-171, was fast-tracked, pushed out the door, and then agencies were given the ability to start making reference to it in their contracts and agreements. So the short answer is it's probably already happening. I'll bet you right now there are agencies making reference to it in future drafts of contracts and agreements. So it, it's going to be out there right now because we're a year into implementation. Um, so another question right here? Yes, ma'am? What's your email address? Pat. This, no, no, it's a mark. Riddle at nara. Gov. Uh, yes, sir. Were your notice on written agreements with recommendations to actually foreign No. So the question was, will our notice on written agreements include guidance on foreign sharing? Short answer is no. Actually, whenever we draft anything at the executive or at the executive agent. That's what ISOO calls itself for the CY program. We always consult with affected agencies. So that particular notice, we sent it out to our implementation working group. And our folks from the Department of State you know, commented on it. It doesn't address that. But the federal regulation does. So that short answer is no, it won't address that. But there probably will be something coming out in the future. OK, real quick. Did I have a question over here? Yes, ma'am? Um, some folks will have to have the unclassified information. Some folks have to write uh, have collateral. Some folks have to set higher classifications of data. How is the CUI program going to be implemented so that people will not um, have so many things that they have to remember about protection? You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Things are going to overlap. So I think the, the question is, you know, how are we going to, it's a training question about is, is there going to be overlap in all the information types that we have to protect? We have classified, we have CUI, we have, you know, other information that can't be released from an agency unless there's um, procedures associated with it that need to be followed. The, the answer to that, of course, is through training. First policy and then training. So trainings, what you're going to see is a lot of, a lot of honorable mentions identifying other modules. So individuals within agencies, are, of course, are going to be um, targeted or categorized based off of the information types that they're going to handle and work with. 
The cleared folks are real easy. You have a security clearance, you need to take this training. You're working with PCII or general CUI, this type. Um, the general CUI awareness training, like if you're not expected to handle or produce any specified types of CUI, shouldn't be that uh, cumbersome for you. But if you're uh, what I, would, I used to call them super users, it's very appropriate still, if you're one of these folks within an agency who handles and works with law enforcement sensitive information or PCII, you're conducting ongoing investigations, you will receive specific training. Now right now, everybody is already receiving general training on what their agency is protecting and how to protect that information. And if you were to go to any training center like the FLETCs or out in Oklahoma City for the FAA or anywhere else out in the United States, there are specific training modules that speak to information types. When you think about the world of what it's going to take to implement the program, those need to change too. Now, for the most part, the good news is, is that the protective measures that you have in place are probably pretty close from a physical standpoint, from a training standpoint. You just need to get everybody wise on the idea of marking and identification and how to translate what those markings mean to ensure consistent protections. Believe it or not, the rest of the government doesn't know what no foreign means. Everybody in this room does. But that's a thing in the unclassified environment when it comes to protecting information. There are information types that that needs to be adhered and communicated to the recipients in a standardized way. I had a question, sir? Are these standardizations going to apply also to legislative and judicial branches? No. So the question is, is the CUI program going to apply to judicial and legislative branches? The short answer is no. But with that being said, those entities have actually reached out to us over the past couple of years. They wanted to know where we were going, and they wanted to know how they could adapt it to their worlds. The CUI program is an executive branch program based off of an executive order. So its scope is limited to the executive branch agencies and by extension to any non-federal entities that we enter into contracts and agreements with. So they're going to have an, an awareness of what this information is, and they've already reached out to us for what markings are going to look like, what are the safeguards. So that way, when they receive something from us, they know that we're protecting it for a reason. But they're under no obligation to protect it in the same way. So the question is, they're under no obligation to protect it in the same way. Short answer is yes, they're not. I know they're not. It should. Well, the thing with me about information security and sharing is it's all about marking and identification, right? Sometimes information from the executive branch has to be shared with entities outside of the executive branch, whether they be the, you know, the legislative, the judicial, or state and local officials. And when that information is conveyed to them, because it has to be sometimes for a lawful government purpose, there is going to be an alert on the page that says, we are protecting this information. And sometimes, we, we can ask, we can hope that they protect it, but we can't compel them to. But a lot of entities out there, they understand to protect that information. So, great question. So, I think that I have to turn it back over to my director here. So, please, if you have any further questions, don't hesitate to call me. Please subscribe to the blog. That's a good way to get information and also reach out to us. So, I'm going to turn it back over to Mark Bradley. Thank you. long morning and I'm going to make this very quick. Uh, one of the things that's, that's occurred to me as I go through my directorship here is, is that ISOO needs to do more, more training. Uh, what you're going to see is you're going to see two things from us. You're going to see us kind of revamp how we do uh, reviews. Idea is to make them much shorter, to use technology more, and also to make them more targeted. I would rather cure one problem than identify six and treat them superficially. Again, uh, that's part of that's being run by resources. We don't, frankly, have the resources to do some of the things we did in the past. And I don't know about you all. Uh, we're still waiting, uh, obviously, for a budget. And when it comes, though, it'll be smaller than it is now. So we have to be a lot smarter about how we want to use it. Uh, one of the things that we, we're going to do also, too, is establish a new training unit. Uh, Peggy Ushman, please stand up. Peggy uh, is one of my most experienced people. Uh, one of the things that I noticed in our annual report is we have recurring problems, or recurring errors that we're identifying, especially in marking classified information. So we're going to try to cure that. We're going to try to cure that through training. We're using YouTube. We're using webinars. Everything we can do. Training sessions in here. That said, if you think that you need a tutorial, uh, personal training session, please reach out to, to Peggy, and we will arrange that. 
again, you're not alone in this world. Um, I think today has been uh, extraordinarily useful. I hope it's been useful to, uh, to you all, too. Again, please let us know how we can help you help yourselves. All right, with that, I'm going to adjourn, and uh, thank you all for coming.